please welcome your Commander-in-Chief, Jeremy Clarkson. Man may have tempered the specter of nuclear evil, but tonight I have the unenviable task of reporting that warfare has been taken out of man's hands. We're now at the mercy of machines, and a battle the likes of which we've never seen before is about to begin. Outside the studio, women have lashed themselves to the railings. Britain is about to witness the birth of robot wars, which is all about robots fighting. Men and women have spent up to six months building these machines, and in the next 30 minutes, most of them are going to be smashed. They're all in the pits now, though, with Philippa Forrester. I'm surrounded by 36 teams, and over the next few weeks, they're all going to be battling for a place in the grand final. They include some of the best technicians, engineers, and radio control experts in Britain today. But even though there's only a few seconds left before the first event, they're still making final adjustments. Each week we'll take six of those teams and let them fight it out here in our underground bomb-proof amphitheatre. They'll be fighting obstacle courses, they'll be fighting each other, and most worrying of all, they'll be going head-to-head -head with pure, indestructible evil. The House Robots. Shunt. Introducing Shunt, a power-packed robot capable of pulling a Land Rover and cleaving all opponents in two with that sharpened steel axe. Matilda. Prehistoric Matilda's next up with hydraulic tusks and a truly lethal chainsaw tail running at over 3,000 revs per minute. Sergeant Bash. Keeping order, Sergeant Bash featuring a savage circular saw and a flamethrower certain to leave all opponents hot under the collar. And dead metal with the pneumatic pincers and a steel cutting arm. I'm your commentator, Jonathan Pierce, and these are the house robots. Now, let's see what the competitors have brought along to match that. First, from Bodmin Community College, Roadblock. Weighing in at 82 and a half kilograms and over 1.45 meters long, all the signs suggest that this is a robot to be reckoned with, carrying a deadly circular saw. From Maidstone, Kilotron. Don't let the lurid fluorescent bank work fool you. Weighing in at 72.2 kilos, powered by two 24-volt wheelchair motors and featuring a mighty pickaxe. Kilotron bound to tickle his opponents more than pink. From Hagley Roman Catholic High School, Barry. This school-based engineering project features a pneumatic bulldozer-inspired scoop and is powered from two 24-volt wheelchair motors. Barry packs a real punch and is the heaviest robot in the field. From Nottingham, Shogun. Built around a complex chassis featuring two Sinclair C5 motors and a two-stage gearbox, Shogun can achieve a maximum speed of seven miles an hour, and weapons include a motorized forklift and the honor of the samurai. From Dublin, Nemesis. Surrounded by lethal stainless steel spikes and a pneumatic ram, this fur-covered robot isn't as cuddly as it looks. Weighing in at 76.8 kilograms, Nemesis hopes to uphold Celtic honor here on Robot Wars. From Coventry, Grunt. Finally, tonight's fastest robot with a top speed of 15 miles an hour, running off two 12-volt wheelchair motors. With a zero turning circle and three millimeter ground clearance, Grunt is definitely lean, mean, and deadly keen. Back to you, Jeremy. The actual structure of these wars is very simple. There are various disciplines, and the loser from each is eliminated. Surviving robots then fight each other, and the overall winner from tonight will return at the end of the series for a grand final. On now, though, with the first discipline. This is the gauntlet, and you can run it almost any way you like. It's up to each robot here to choose which route is the best according to their robot's hidden talents. First of all, though, they have to get off this spinning carousel. Then, do they choose on my right this maze? But you have to have an awful lot of maneuverability to get round it. Or a seemingly dead space on my left. It's not. It's guarded by the horrible Sergeant Bash. The middle route is the ramp route, but not every robot can get up on and off these ramps. And then there are the corkscrew lances, just one of many hidden surprises that can leap out at you if you're unaware. To my right, spikes come up from underneath the floor of the arena. You don't want to be impaled on those. And if you did survive on my left, a scorching by Sergeant Bash, 
There's still dead metal who can clamp hold of you. And the might of Matilda waiting. Well, there's one more surprise here in the shape of the pendulum. It could knock you sideways and send your time rocketing. Now, Roboteers, be prepared to amuse and impress us, but be prepared also to be humiliated. Robot Roboteers, stand by. A-level students Hender Blewett and Chris Kinsey from Bodmin attempt the gauntlet for the first time ever. Our main feature is at the front where we can push with some force and we hope to create some serious damage Two. later on with our main weapon One. at the back. Activate. For the first time in the history of Robot Wars, the gauntlet is run. And out comes Roblox. He does not want to be torched. In goes Matilda. Dead Metal is beaten. He's big Chris Kinsey, the tall blonde there. And this is a good run here by Roadblock, and that's very fast. There was a moment there, guys, I thought you weren't going to get off the turntable. Did that go through your minds? Well, yeah, we were having a bit of trouble getting it straight off. Our main plan was to go over that bridge, actually. As we were steering onto it, we found a gap and went for it. What were you operating? So you operated the saw. Did you get anyone? Afraid not. We just were too damn quick. <laughs> Very well done. That's a good win. They were quick. They set the standard. First to run, first on the leaderboard. Robot ears, stand by. The Barry controllers, 17-year-old Amy Sprout and Daniel Parry. Pupils from the Hagley Roman Three, Catholic High School. Two, one. Activate. Our second set of A-level students. Oh, they've chosen a wrong route right from the start, surely, because Bash is there. Amy Sprout and Daniel Parry. Don't tarry with Barry. There they go for the ramp, but they've only got a ground clearance of six centimetres. Will that be costly? They've only ever made a cassette rack before. And a key fob, and they're going to be fobbed off here. Yeah. I'll be operating the pneumatic blade. It'll go down like that, scoop along the floor, and hopefully knock the other robots over. We decided to go for the big balloon tyres for extra traction. The whole robot works on 24 volts. And they need to get those wheelchair motors moving now because Matilda's in and she's hungry for rubber! And the pupils from Hagley High seem to me to be left hanging high and dry! Gone. No power. Stop and deactivate robots. Well, you were lucky there because you were about to be eaten. Yeah. Now, what possessed you to go that way? We decided to go that way because we thought we could get through, but what happened was, when we actually went over, we got caught on the um, grills at the bottom, and so it just didn't move. Never mind. So it's back to embroidery now, is it? Well, I think so. Because that's a vicious thing. Uh, poor Amy and Barry, only 2.93 metres. That's vulnerable. Robot ears, stand by. The Shogun team, Robin Woodhead, Brian Carrington and Peter Fairbrother, all work colleagues at Rolls-Royce. This is Shogun. Uh, we've got a few armaments on it. Down this side we've got uh, some tips which are interchangeable so we can put different spikes on. It's an hydraulic ram. On the front we've got a couple of forks which can be used for lifting or for anchoring us down onto the ground. Three, two, one. Activate. So the Warriors from Nottingham with Shogun with very little to do. The worst runner in the gauntlet goes out of course. Wasn't that one in the middle in Star Wars? I'm sure I've seen him somewhere before. Shogun. Oh, off the ramp, officer. Breathalyze that driver. Matilda's there. Oh, well, you're right there. Your humiliation reigns supreme. I think so. You're not going to get out of that one. Not with Matilda. Stop and deactivate robots. I did warn you that humiliation was an option, but I bet you couldn't have foreseen it would end like that. No. If you don't try, you don't win. So what happened? The response to the right turn wasn't fast enough and it slipped off the edge. And unfortunately, the house robot failed to write it for you. I don't think he was trying to write it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was trying to damage it. I think you're probably right. Still, all is not lost. That's not a bad distance. Thank you. 10.71 metres, enough to put them in second place, they're through. Robot ears, stand by. The Nemesis team from Dublin, controllers Peter Redmond and William Murphy, aviation technicians backed by engineer Joe Gavin. Nemesis' primary weapon is a pneumatic ram, 150 PSA pneumatic ram. 
Even though we might look furry and friendly, Three. we've got a two mil stainless steel two. can. We're going to take plenty One. of that. Activate. The Dublin boys with Nemesis. Haven't they got taste? Red and black polka dots and that ghastly grin and red fur, surely vulnerable to flame, I would have thought. But this is a good run. Already dead metal's out of it. Look at that horrible grin. And Matilda waits, and that's a good dummy for Matilda. And that's a very good run, and they're through. Fantastic. But it is a good piece of fortune you never went near the flamethrower. Oh, thank God for that. I thought he was going to destroy us. <laughs> Marvellous. Good. Nothing could destroy the grinning red armchair. Nemesis the fastest so far. Robot ears, stand by. Grunt, controlled by 21-year-old Matthew Dickinson, a radio-controlled car enthusiast. Three, two, one. Activate. Matthew Dickinson, 21 years of age, wants to join the army. He's into radio controlled cars, and that's a good start by Grunt. Dead metal with those pincers is foiled, and this is very quick so far. And Matilda's beaten, and Grunt is through. You have to know, right? You've got a choice of three courses, and you take on our three robots. Uh, it's quicker. <laughs> You're not joking. That was a stunning run. Congratulations. Not quite as quick as Nemesis, though, but Grunt through in second place. Robot ears, stand by. Last to go, Killatron, driver Richard Broad, Three, and the father and son team, Abdul Degia on the left, one. Ian Degia on the right. Debate. The Barry team awaits nervously. They're vulnerable. Killatron just has 2.93 metres to beat to eliminate Barry. It's done that with that awful fluorescent pink. And the dreadful pickaxe drivers Abdul and Richard with that sort of weaponry and colouring. I'd go and see a psychiatrist if I was you. This is Killatron, and this is why. Impaled on the pneumatic drill and stuck there on the side of the second ramp. Ooh, bash with the torch as well. It's all going wrong. Onto my bed, bed springs, and I can tell you they're painful. You won't beat Springs with a pickaxe, boys. What are you doing? Stop and deactivate robots. It's fair to call that an X certificate run there. That was pure violence. I enjoyed that, but I would have been better to get the other end. Yeah, it would have been, but you've gone a long way, and I feel sure that'll get you through. So well done. Congratulations. <laughs> Yes, the boys with Killatron last to taste the gauntlet of through in 11.02 metres, but Barry is eliminated. I cannot believe Barry the robot is out so soon. I know, I mean, we just got caught on the ramp, and this is the outside of the circuits, and it just went. These things happen. Are you really disappointed? Yeah. The end of round one, let's see how they're doing. Guys, this hammer got you out of trouble in fine style. It certainly did. We sustained a flat side and a couple of broken wheel trims, but... Nothing you can't recover from? Yeah, that's right. Superficial damage here. Is it only superficial? Yeah, it is. It'll be fine. No problem. Well done. Thank you. We're really happy. It must be. I think we're the fastest wheelchair on earth. Are we allowed to see your robot with no clothes on? Oh, yeah, he's not shy. Do you ever take your waistcoats off, though? That's what I want to know. Oh, we have to wear them. The other two team members who couldn't make it made us wear them. <laughs> the good thing is, though, you avoided the flamethrower. That's the main thing, yeah. We weren't a, just a ball of flame down the, the, the course. Just repairing, here we are. Just a quick spray and we're all done. Do you see what I mean? They're all ready for the next event. Now, I've seen sumo wrestling, and basically it's just two fat blokes in pants leaning on each other. But robot sumo is different because, of course, robots don't wear pants. What happens here is that each of our five surviving robots is brought onto this raised plinth in turn where they will do battle with our most powerful house robot. He's called Shunt. If he were a car, he'd be a tank. Yes, all right, we're very impressed. Stop it. Sit still. Thank you. Now, the roboteer that lasts the shortest time is history. Well, Shogun's ready, and he's ready, and I'm in the middle. Bye. Robot ears, stand by. Three. Shogun, the first two, to face the ferocity of one, Shunt in the sumo ring. 
Shogun, you have to stay in the sumo ring for a minute or as long as possible against Shunt. And let me tell you, Shunt can push a four-wheel drive off-roader. Good low center of gravity, only 33 centimeters high, Shogun. That could be crucial in this round. Slowly end stop, though. Oh, 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 oh. 22 seconds, I am reliably informed. So how does that feel? Not good enough. And what was going to happen if you'd won it? Well, we had hoped to blow Shunt a kiss as he went over the edge. Blow him a kiss? Oh, isn't that sweet? But I think he's blowing him a raspberry. Still 22 seconds. <laughs> Nothing is decided yet. Let's bring on the next one. The official Robo Wars clock, though, Jeremy. 21.51 seconds for Shogun. Roboteers, stand by. Three, two, one, activate. And it's Killatron in the pink. Just in case you'd forgot, with that pickaxe swinging already, heads towards the circle, though. And doom. And a dangerously high ground clearance of 10 centimetres, because Shunt can get in underneath that and push them to the edge of the sumo circle. They're already through, though. They're through now. They've beaten Shogun's time. Could they go? Could they go? Almost over. It's the lip of the circle. And they've just stayed in there. Richard Ian and Abdul. Tremendous driving. Stalemate at the moment. Driving those 24 ball wheelchair motors. And Shunt slowly, inexorably pushes again. Sumo! Kinatron stays its ground. This is tremendous stuff. Only seven seconds, boys. Go on, do it. Four seconds, you can do it. Two seconds, they're going to go through. Six. It's a marvellous run. If that thing ever needs a job on a roadwork site... <laughs> that was interesting, wasn't it? God. It was interesting. I'm glad you haven't even inflicted any damage on mine, though, which is uh, delightful to see. But you lasted the minute. Well done. Brilliant. Really enjoyed what it was. That was great. Thanks. Tremendous run. They've survived the minute. They're through. But Shogun, a wee bit nervy. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one. Activate. I think that 200-yard sign wedge on the front could be crucial here to scoop up and undershunt. Good driving at the moment. And Hender Blewett and Chris Kinsey who built Roadblock as an A-level project down in Bodmin. And they're using the 24-volt electric engines well here. That's a little bit like a, a bullfighting matador contest out there. They're already through safely with a good time. Oh, look at this! Shunt's gone! And death by glory! They've gone too! And they're through, but the fact they went out of the circle right at the end, they're second to kill a shot. Well, unbelievable. We don't know what the rules say. The rules say you won. Excellent. <laughs> the rules say you threw, you got him out within the minute. That must be incredibly nerve-wracking. Terrible, terrible. Can't believe it. But he made the mistake. Yep, and we took advantage of it. Honestly, a brilliant show. Brilliant. Well done. And they're through, but the fact they went out of the circle right at the end, they're second to Killatron. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one, activate. Nemesis gives Shunt the eye and that evil grin. Those spikes look deadly as well. It's all about traction and talk. And Nemesis could talk in tongues here because there's a little pneumatic ram shaped like a viper's tongue that could come out any minute and kill off Shunt. Oh, he's not going to go again, surely! We thought Shunt was unbeatable and fearless! Go on, Shunt, get out! Talk about living on the edge! A nemesis surely through! Marvellous! <clears throat> that was my friend, and you knocked him off. <laughs> yeah, we stuck the tail out with the three big spikes and jammed the wheels. Is that what you did then? You were able to knock him off? Yeah, well, that's tactics we were working on all day. <laughs> this is getting to be a habit. Everyone's killing my mate. Woo! <laughs> I hate you. I hate you for winning that. Jeremy's friends, electric-driven robots. Interesting. Nemesis through. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one. 
activate. Matthew Dickinson has to survive 21.51 seconds with blood to go through, and he's not going to do it, is he? He's out already. <laughs> you blithering idiot. Could you not see the edge? Yeah, good. <laughs> you did so well in the gauntlet. I mean, like, this is really good steering and then really terrible steering. It was, when not it? It was terrible. <laughs> I think you'd better go home, only really quietly, all right? Just okay. sneak away. I'll bend down now, and then we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Not so nice. Over in a trice, and Grunt goes in spectacular style. Just 4.15 seconds. Here in the pits, the tension's rising, along with the levels of activity as they prepare for the crucial semi-finals. Do you want to know who you're up against in the semi-finals? Yes. It might help. It would help. Killatron. Yes. Killatron. Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're really happy, really, really happy. <laughs> it's that old big smile. <laughs> Who are we up against? Who do you want to be up against? I'd say we'll have a chance with all of them. <laughs> with all of them? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it won't matter. Follow me down the table to meet your opponents for the semi final, the Roblox team. Hi. Trouble is, we just can't seem to make up our mind what blade to use. <laughs> Now, all they've got to do, really, is just bash their opponents into several small pieces within a specified time. But if there is no clear winner, a decision will be made by our panel of adjudicators using four criteria. Damage, aggression, style and control. On the left, we have Eric Dickinson, the only British veteran of robot wars in America. In the centre, there's Professor Noel Sharkey, who's head of robotics at Sheffield University. And on the right, there's Adam Harper, who is holder of the land speed record for electric vehicles. The man did 150 miles an hour in a Sinclair C5. The man is certifiable. But he's not as certifiable as our opponents, who will now indulge in the first semi-final. Robot ears, stand by. Three... Two, one, activate. Roadblock and Nemesis not only need to avoid each other, but our own house robots in their patrol areas go in there and you're in trouble. The boys from Dublin will use the spikes and the hydraulic prong. And Roadblock will use that saw, activated by Hender Blewett. And Roadblock could choke on a furball. Nemesis is being ripped to shreds at this moment in time. They need to get away from that saw. Oh, that could be a mistake by Roadblock. It's gone in with Matilda and the spikes, and it's impaled on the spikes. Matilda's saw and that vicious tail. This could be a tail of two saws. Roadblock away. Now attacks Nemesis again, gets underneath. The Nemesis boys all want to go into space, and they're in the air. They're in the air, and they're on fire. Trouble! It could all be over for Nemesis shortly now! Well, as you can see, the soft furnishings are on fire. Fire extinguishers have been brought out. So, pretty obviously, Roadblock is the winner! That was fantastic! Absolutely brilliant. Well done. How did it feel out there? We absolutely loved it. It's gone from an armchair to a three-piece suite. <laughs> well done. Congratulations. He's not even gone. Have I left? It's only cosmetic. He'll be back to fight again another day. Here, you've put something extra on the end of this. What? <laughs> Those spikes weren't on there before. Well, it's uh, one of our optional extras. <laughs> Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one, activate. The aim of the game, to immobilise your opponent. If you can't do that, the judge is looking to score on damage, aggression, control and, and shogun. Running away at the moment, there's Yoda from Star Wars. I knew he was in that team. Killatron looking the more aggressive with the pickaxe. 
Shogun trying to evade, but it's got to get out of that space. This is not good driving at the moment. They don't seem to be able to avoid Killatron. He seems to be having something of a fit. Oh! Shogun is stuck on the grill! And Killatron comes in for the kill! Bash! And again! Oh dear! And the sergeant's lost his sword! I enjoyed that. You put your pickaxe, which I like a lot, incidentally, through his skin. Yeah, that's true. After all the work he's putting in that, I feel a bit bad about that. I'll bet you do. <laughs> I bet you're going to really regret it all the way through the next round where we'll see you. Outrageous damage has been done to the bottom end of Killatron. Yeah. Isn't it? So whether a piece is penetrating in some way, yeah. knocked a wire off. Yeah. Do you think you can be ready for the final now? No trouble. How come you ended up on the grill? We had problems with the speed controller. We burnt one of them, we put another one in, it didn't match. Consequently, we didn't have the right hand turning capacity that we thought we had. They were just not matched. Just a few seconds until you go on, how's it going? Well, everything seems to be working fine and we're looking forward to getting out there. Tactics? Straight in, straight out. Killatron, how's it going? Very well, very well. We just hope the batteries hold out and um, our tactics work out right. What are your tactics? Well, it depends what way they come at us, really. We'll just have to... we just have to see. Oh, boy, am I looking forward to this final. We've got Killatron and we've got Roadblock. And I need to be about 500 miles away. Are you ready, guys? Yes? Yes? Get in your boxes. Woo! Roboteers, stand by. Three, two, one. Activate. Killatron against the battle star roadblock. The pickaxe against the circular saw, and the pickaxe gets in first. The old polka dots of Nemesis on Roadblock, a distant memory. But that scoop's so important again, getting in underneath Kinnatron. And the Trojan team befuddled at the news, and in comes the sergeant with the torch. The Roadblock boys controlling this final of the moment. And Kinnatron's on the run, it's piggyback time. They're in and under. Kinetron, it's only a question of time, they know it! Kinetron will be in for the big, big flip! They're gonna flip him! No! It's all over! Roadblock the winner! Winner is Roadblock! Yes, come up here, guys! Leaping about in a sort of football-type way, they enjoy that. I loved every second of it. But particularly the second when it fell over, yeah? That's what we were looking for all day. What about you? We just couldn't wait to take them out. They've been, they've been cocky in the pits, and now they're, they're over. They're, they're upside down. You're through to the big grand final. Congratulations. OK, we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. A new type of war came out of nowhere and rocked the very fabric of society. When the cruise missiles were gingerly lifted from their silos in Berkshire, we figured the world would be a safer place. But we were reckoning without robot wars. World leaders are in a blind panic. Last week it was reported that Tony Blair actually stopped grinning for five minutes. Alexander Haig has flown to Buenos Aires, but that's... Probably a bit silly, because for now, the fighting is confined to Britain. Tonight, as usual, six robots will face assault courses and head-to-head -head battles, on which they must succeed if they want a place in our end-of-series grand final. 
Let's meet them. First, from Gillingham, Ugly Box. With a simple pyramid design to ensure greater stability and maximum defense, weighs in at 71.9 kilograms, runs off two electric wheelchair motors, and this is clearly a robot to look out for. From London, Scrapper. Weighing in at 76 and a half kilos, Scrapper might not be the fastest robot in the field, but makes up for it with speed and maneuverability. Variable motors give an optimum speed of 10 miles an hour and a zero turning circle. That could be crucial. From midfield near Stowmarket, recycled. Completely recycled, cost less than 100 pounds to build. Weighs in at 79 and a half kilos, certain to give all opponents a licking with his pneumatically driven steel tongue, a reach of over 90 centimeters. From Dartford Girls Grammar School, Detonator. This school designed robot runs off a lawnmower engine and a 12 volt electric motor salvaged from a Vauxhall Cavalier. Weighs in at 52 and a half kilos and runs at a steady 4 miles an hour. From Cambridge University, Mortis. Carrying a deadly Japanese piercing blade and one of tonight's heaviest robots, weighs in at 78.4 kilos, designed around two 12 volt wheelchair motors, giving an optimum speed of 9 miles an hour. From Lee City Technology College, Leebot. Runs off two 24 volt motors and weighs in at 69 kilos. Leebot travels at a maximum speed of three miles an hour, fashioned from bulletproof stainless steel. Might not be the fastest and deadliest, but certainly full of surprises. So there they are. Now let's see how they get on in the first of tonight's events. This is the gauntlet, a unique opportunity to see man and machine in perfect harmony. At least that's what our roboteers are hoping for, but the path is paved with peril. They have one and a half minutes to guide their robots to the haven of the finish line, but the strength of Shunt, the scorch of Sergeant Bash, and the might of Matilda are waiting. May any robot that meets them rust in pieces. Roboteers, stand by. Our first roboteers, 15-year-olds Robin Williams and Chris Malan from Lee City Technology College. Let's demonstrate some of the features. Here's an arm which comes forward with a weapon on the front. And at the rear, we've got a grinding disc for grinding the opposition. Three, two, one. And sometimes you've got to grind out results when you don't perform well. Driver Robin taking to the ramp. You can either go the maze, the ramp, or take on the house robot. In comes Bash with the flamethrower. There's the camera on the flamethrower. Oh, blocking tactics by Bash. He stopped the ramp from descending. Now it does. And on it goes this silver woodlouse, Lee Bot. The second ramp to negotiate. More flame and smoke. What's that, though? That's a fan! And smoke does not get in your eyes! Magnificent stuff, and we did not know about that point! Ingenuity and technology! And Leebot beyond Matilda! And Leebot through! I didn't think you were going to make it that way. You must be feeling great. Yeah. Because <laughs> you didn't think it was going to get up the ramp, did you? No, we took it a bit of an angle. And it made it. Well done. Congratulations. Let's have a look at that innovative fan once again, clearing the way through the smoke so that the boys could see their way through to the end of the course. First to run and already there on the leaderboard. Roboteers, stand by. Mike Smith, Mike Rickard and Ken Tugood, all electronics engineers from London. Three, two, one, activate. They call themselves the On The Edge team. On the edge of the ramp, does it go up there with its maximum climb of 35 degrees? Does it take on the house robot shunt there on the right of the picture? Or does it go into the maze? And this is Scrapper. We have some lovely sharp blades on the back, which I hope to do some damage with. We have our control panel here that turns all the motors and the power on. We was going to run on plutonium, but hey, we've had to go to batteries. And on the front, we've got some cutting blades which we hope are going to do a lot of damage. It also has its two nasty flashing eyes. No, not on him, on that, you see? And it does take on the maze. Now this will need some clever driving in there. Around the first area of the maze, sharp turn required. Ah, 
is into the sheep's pen, and this could be lambs to the slaughter, because Bash and Shunt are closing in, and it could be roast lamb at that, if the torch comes out, and it does! Lamb, key bag! <laughs> that is gallows humour if I've ever seen it. Stop and deactivate robots. Well, you seem to be enjoying yourself as months of work was destroyed there. Bit of a change of plan, I saw at the beginning, yeah? yeah a bit of a stuck on the ramp, but uh, we thought, well, what, go for the maze, what the heck? But uh, we got stuck on the rail there a bit. Well, I think you got stuck as a result of being rammed onto it. Still, you got a couple of feet, so maybe you're not going home. Scrapper. Scorched. Stunned. Shunted. Silenced. 7.4 metres. Will that be enough to see them safe? Robot ears, stand by. Driver, former TV presenter Rex Garrett and his engineer mate Simon West. It's called Recycle Ops because it's made entirely out of recycled materials from scrapyards. It has a quite lethal weapon which comes out and then flips up. Three, two, one. Activate. So out comes Recyclops with the tongue. Aye, aye. Will he take on Shunt there? Well, he does. And a nice little turn of pace beyond the skittles. In comes Bash. And that's finger licking hot stuff in there. All beyond Bash and Shunt. And there's a lovely little bit of driving and crashes beyond Matilda and through. Well, you were confident before you started, and now you must be feeling even better. Not really. I wanted one of them to go over. <laughs> you wanted to turn one of our house robots over. Well, certainly. That's a game, isn't it? <laughs> it's a game, but it's also impossible. No. Still well done for finishing. Congratulations. And finishing in the fastest time so far. Recyclops, top of the leaderboard. Robot ears, stand by. Pupils Vicky Allgood and Claire Greenaway, teacher David Crosby, they call themselves the Femme Fatale. Three. Two, one, activate. And they send Detonator out into the gauntlets, or do they? Because he's stuck by a spike. And can't get out of the ugly turntable. This is our robot detonator. This is our light sensor, which is mainly for decoration, but it's also to confuse the opposition. And this is our ramp, which is our main weapon. Inside, we've got a petrol-driven lawnmower engine to drive us forwards. And at the back, we're going to have another engine to power us backwards. Poor old David looks about 74, 75, 76. He's a Star Trek fan. Beam him up, Scotty. Oh, no, no, no. Oh! That might actually have just thrust detonator free. Given a shunt now, oh, no. but back onto the railings. <laughs> I'll tell you what, David. Nuclear driven, petrol driven, electric driven, doesn't matter. You're not going to get very far. Not now. Go on, 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 guys. Stop and deactivate roots. You go to hospital and get your heart mended, and you tell me what that was like. Awful. <laughs> it wouldn't see, it wouldn't see left at all, and then when we got the spike stuck, it was just got totally stuck. Yeah, well, that spike, you must have just thought, that's it. Yeah, we thought we were dead. Most people hate the robots, the house ones, but you love them, yeah? Yeah, I do now. <laughs> well, well done. Congratulations. Ooh, not quite as far as Scrapper. Seven metres. Will that be enough to save them? Listen to that round of applause. It's fantastic. I could hardly bear to watch. I didn't want to watch at all. Well, I didn't want to watch either, but I had to. <laughs> go, go, go. We were like, go, and just went, and we just went. Robot ears, stand by. Our next academic aggressors, Rob Knight, Chris Sawsby, and Arthur Chilcott from Cambridge University. This is our robot, Mortis. It was a tank style vehicle with traps, as you reckon, gives it more control. It's very powerful, it's very fast. It has a very, very large axe blade on the front. And for protection, we have carbon and Kevlar armor plating, which is very hard indeed. I reckon we're in the chance. I reckon. Three, two, one. 
Activate. Very hard, very fast, very confident. Quick off the mark. And beyond bash. Ooh, the flame licks out. Seems to be a problem, actually. Maybe with the steering, I'm not too sure. Shunt is there as well. And the axe goes in. And the axe has trapped Mortis being dragged back there. Now Matilda's in on the action too with the onboard camera. And they are pinned. Matilda and Shunt and Bash, the house robot's doing a magnificent job. You can see the axe there impaling him, pinning him down. And now getting a lick of flame. We're not going to let you go anywhere. We don't have to. Stop. Deactivate robot. That is tough. And the crowd don't like it. There's Rob Knight's girlfriend, look. He pinned me with the axe. I couldn't drag him. He was too heavy. I couldn't drag both at once. You told me it was powerful. Yeah, I only took three to pin us down. <laughs> no, well, well done. A nice beard, by the way. Congratulations, chaps. He got nearly as far as the girls from Dartford. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dick, <laughs> Actually, just a little bit further than Detonator, trying with Scrapper. So, Cambridge, you got attacked by all three robots, and then Jeremy insulted your beard. Jeremy who? <laughs> Robot ears, stand by. Paul Sherwood, the driver, and Colin Faulkner, future in-laws. Three, two, one. And let's go, let's go, let's go to the ugly butt ball, to the ball, to the ball. Driver Paul collects bonsai trees in his spare time. Oh, banzai! In comes Shunt. Paul's a ceiling plasterer by trade. And your robot is being plastered. He's got to get off that wall. On the back of it, we've got some extremely sharp cutting discs. We just pass our very sharp cutting blade on the front of it. Inside we've got various batteries, one large speed controller, a couple of motors, wheels, and one large flashing light just for a bit of a gimmick, followed by the radio gear at the back. This is Ugly Bot. Hopefully we'll win. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Stop. I don't think we're going to have to wait much longer, Paul, because you're stuck in the corner and you're not getting very far. Those teeth look like a pair of garden secretaries to me, anyway. And Shunt is doing his job there. He's certainly earning his engine oil tonight. Paul stuck fast. Oh, now can he get out, though? No, driven back to the turntable. It's actually quite good, because you have ended up pretty much uh, where you started from. Yeah, we gave it our best shot. Okay, have you got your bus timetable on? Yeah, there's one goes in a few minutes. I'm sure you'll be on it. And the popular girls from Dartford saved by an appalling 1.65 metres. Never mind. Seven months and all them long nights, and we don't care. We'll be back next year. Recyclops here. How much damage did you sustain? None whatsoever. That's exactly what we like to hear. Sleebot, you got all the way through. Congratulations to you. Girls, how many spikes did you lose? Um, well, knocked out that. Knocked out them. We haven't actually lost them yet. They're in there somewhere, but they're, they're still here. And did you get to use your saws on our robots? Not this time, not this time. But next time we will. It's slightly bent, but it's got to be straightened out. We're, uh, no problem. Right, that's one robot gone, and now it's time to say goodbye to another as we play British Bulldogs. This is basically a robotic version of the old school playground game where the robots have to get from one side of the arena to the other. The one that covers the shortest distance or who reaches the line last is eliminated. Couldn't be simpler. Well, yes, except trying to stop them are our school bullies. Matilda, Sergeant Bash, Shunt and Dead Metal. This is a wall of steel and testosterone. Well, not you, Matilda, but... I think people know what I mean. How seriously are you guys taking this? Uh, probably a bit too seriously. A um, bit too seriously? Yeah. Describe what you've done to this robot. Um, I think everything. We've got aerospace grade materials off as many people as we could. It's all aerospace aluminium, titanium, carbon fibre, Kevlar, really top grade stuff. Do you think you can win? I think we may have a chance, yeah. Surely, with your power, you should be able to flip it if you come up against Mortis. Well, yes, I should be able to, but I've got to get the uh, tongue in the right place. 
Would you like to be on the receiving end of that? Well, there's no need to be. You've got wheels, you can get away. Dartford girls team, what problems are you having? You're meant to be in the arena now. Steering at the moment, we're trying to get it to steer to the left. It'll take us about two minutes to clear it. We've got to clean the axle brace down a little bit, and that'll give us a freedom of movement again. Roboteers, stand by. Three, two, one. Activate. Let's see if the detonator repairs have worked. Well, it's slowly away. In fact, it's not even away. The girl's only 15, and detonator can't even move. Recyclops is pegged. Oh, what a run through by Mortis! And the boys from Jesus College Cambridge are there already. That was stunning. Still detonator at the start. Poor old David Crosby in pain. Recyclops against Matilda. Matilda interfering with Recyclops. Ugh, what a dreadful thought. And still detonator right back at the start. David Crosby has had enough. He's gone. Now Scrapper making its move. Strangely backwards. And it's through backwards. Oh. And nonetheless, now Lee Bot takes on Shunt. And Recyclops by the pyramid is in problems here. Lee Bot being pushed all over the place. But making steady progress anyway for its team. Watching back in the pits. And slowly, and slowly, and surely, the Woodlouse is through. But look at Matilda there, stopping the progress of all Recyclops until then, it's flipped! Well, you got underneath Matilda and flipped her over. She will not be pleased. And back at the start, Detonator, still with so many problems. Cease. Oh, no. Oh, no. Girls, did no one explain you were supposed to be going that way? Yeah, they did, but I batched it before we even started. So you got no control? I had no control over it at all. And how much work did you put into it? Everything. We've been working for days on it. Oh, that's a disaster. That was an amazing run. Oh, thanks. I saw the robots coming for me, came back a bit, turned, went straight for the end, and it worked. But a lot of time building it? Yes, about three months. Not much time for girlfriends. Uh, I wish there was. <laughs> when you, you... You hurt one of my pets. I'm pleased. <laughs> I'm not pleased. It's got a good weapon on it, though. Quite good. Yeah. Quite good. Not bad. And you? Any problems? We actually got through. We changed our tactics this time and actually went backwards, which uh, it seems to steer better backwards for some reason. So uh, it worked, yeah. Yeah, well, well done. It's a good looking one, that one, too. Congratulations, everybody. Commiserations to the girls from Dartford. Yes, they failed to get off the starting lineup. And there you go. Detonator out, but they've given us some great fun. The battery spilled on it um, before we even started. We didn't notice it. The girls were shouting down, but we couldn't hear it because of the noise of the engine. So when we came in to watch the monitor, we say, why isn't it moving? And I think, batteries. So that's the end of it for the girls from the Dartford Grammar School for Girls. We're going to win next year, guys. We're going to come back next year to win. <laughs> one broken chain, that's all. Nothing else is damaged. But it still killed one while it was upside down. It's not bad, is it? I just want to ask you, who would you hate to be pitched against for your final battle? Uh, Mortis. Good news for you, then. It is? Yeah, you're Why? up against Recyclops. Oh, yes, we can chew him, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have him. <laughs> I've got a bit of bad news for you guys. You're up against Mortis. Great. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? We'll get creamed. <laughs> I've heard that you think no one can beat you. That is just so untrue. I reckon if 12 of them got together at once, they'd have a good chance. OK, so we move on now to the semi-finals, which will be presided over by the usual panel of adjudicators. On the left, Eric Dickinson, who once upheld the fine and long English tradition of beating the French when his robot beat a French one in Robot Wars in America. In the middle, Noel Sharkey, who's from Sheffield University's Department of Robotics and Ponytails. And on the right, Adam Harper, who once drove a Sinclair C5, he tells me, through a 70-foot wall of flame. Now, throughout the semi-finals, they're going to be looking for damage, aggression, style and control. Well, I'm going to be standing here hoping that Sergeant Bash flambes someone. Robot ears, stand by. Scrapper with six menacing saw blades. Three. Against two, the tongue of Recyclops. One. 
activate. You stick your tongue out at me and I'll, I'll wink at you. Oh, very nice indeed as the two robots come together. Maneuvering for position at the moment. Don't go broadside! Oh, no, no, you shouldn't have done that! Broadside and the tongue came out. Well, well, well. That was quite a performance. The old steam train didn't last a second. Oh, well, that's a pity. I wish I could have a little bit better fight, really. But it's a very good show. What happened, guys? Oh, my words. He was very good. He was very good. I mean, he just tipped us straight over. I mean, it was good to watch. So you've sustained damage? Oh, not a lot. Nothing what can't be put right with a big hammer. Robot ears, stand by. Rob Knight and the Cambridge boys confident with Mortis. Three. Robin Williams and Chris two, Malon with Leebot. One. Activate. Leebot with the angle grinder at the rear and the Lance with the screw drill and running blades to cut and slice. And Mortis with that piercing Japanese blade. Oh, that's not too much of a weapon, is it really? Oh, and that is, look at that Japanese blade, thrusting down, Lee Bot, Pepper Pot, you could pour pepper out of that Lee Bot machine now, look at the holes, but what's Mortis doing, maybe dropping off for another chance, but going very dangerously near a patrol area in the corner, and the house robot could come in and dance, Matilda in there, and there are spikes to come up from the floor, but Mortis is out to attack Lee Bot again, and underneath Lee Bot, could he flip him over? If he does, it's all over! And it is all over! You just make it all look so easy. I reckon the act should have gone through the armor. I'm quite surprised. It's a little tougher than I thought it was. Good heavens above. Well, you're through to the next round. Congratulations. You're up against Mortis, mate. Lovely. Nothing wrong with that. Soup guy. How do you feel about that? Bad. <laughs> He was going to get annihilated anyway, though, so <laughs> we knew it from the start. Let's have a look at the damage that was actually done by that axe. It's quite vicious, isn't it? Yeah, it's strong. It's bent everything up. The batteries actually came out in the end, and that's why it pushed us over. Well, it was a brave fight, though. You kept in there for a long time. Well done. You may be thinking you already know which one's going to win, but here on Robot Wars, the lesson we've learned is that nothing is certain. Guys, what has happened to Mortis? Um, we've broken the main shaft that drives our axe, so we no longer have our main weapon. We're going to actually try and modify the vehicle so we can use it as a batter ram instead. Uh, we don't know how successful it's going to be. Uh, it's just a case of suck it and see, basically. Bye! Good luck! So the quiet confidence seems to have disappeared from the Cambridge team. This should be a humdinger of a final. From Cambridge we've got Mortis out there, nearly indestructible, even though in the last round it broke its axe. And from a place called Mitfield, Recyclops. If that gets underneath us, we're dead because it will stick us in the air. But impact-wise, I reckon we're okay. Because the armour is... Um, Oh, it's bulletproof. I think I can out push Mortis. I've got to get the uh, tongue in the right place. I had to make mine rather theatrical, so it looked nice. And it's not really in the right place. Oh dear, the thought of Rex Garrard getting his tongue in the right place leaves Robot me rather ears, nauseous. Stand by. Three, two, one. Activate. Flat tongue and fluttering eyelashes and all. He prepares to do battle with Mortis, went for a charge there, you see Mortis got broadside on, the tongue can go underneath Mortis and flip him, Mortis dodges away and the judges will be impressed by that style, damage, aggression, control and style will come into count if the robots fail to immobilise each other, they don't want to go into that patrol area, Matilda awaits, she can't come out of that patrol area very far. She'll have to go back in any second now, but she's chasing down on Recyclops. There you see her going back into the patrol area. And Mortis is impaled on a spike. And that's poor driving. That is poor steering, and that'll count against the boys from Cambridge. Chris Sawsby driving, and it's taking damage there from Matilda. Points against Mortis. In comes Recyclops with a good attack. I think the axe blade is bent there as well. More damage then, and more points against them. But Mortis free now to see if they can retaliate. Gets in underneath Recyclops. 
Good defensive work by Recyclops, holding on there. Rex Garrow managing to spin away. Good work by him. Again, Recyclops aggressively goes at Mortis. Out comes the time. Good aggression once again. Mortis retaliates underneath and is now driving into another patrol area. That'll count against him again. Poor steering. And it's stuck on the side bars and needs to get out. And he's negative here. Recyclops is trying to get away, but not Mortis. And Mortis is taking more damage. Cease. And what a baffling finish. And it goes to the judges. Well, it has to be a judge's decision, and we're going to await that. And let's have a look while we wait at some of the points they will be considering. Good dodging by Recyclops, damage to Mortis. Recyclops aggressive and attacking. Poor steering by Mortis, got it in there in the first place, but retaliating. Good defensive work by Recyclops, again aggression from Recyclops. And good defensive work, withstanding the Mortis thrust. And I think this could count against Mortis ultimately driving in there onto the sidebars. OK, the judges have made their decision using the four criteria, damage, control, style and aggression. And their decision is... Recyclops! Well, that's hugely popular in the pits, look, and they're the real experts, the Roboteers. Oh, guys, come on up. What a performance. And a very popular win. Did you think you'd got it? Well, no, not really. But um, I was hoping to tip him over and then go and attack a house robot. That was my ambition. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a fantastic final. We'll see you in the grand final, and we'll see you lot next week. Sweet dreams. Cambridge wish to protest. It's been a popular decision in here. Oh, yes. Standing ovation. Look at this. Hi guys. Can't be very happy. They're not working. We're working. We push them out. We have all the attacks, and we think we should have won. Last week here on Robot Wars, Mortis perforated Lebot. And Recyclops licked Scrapper. But when the smoke settled, Recyclops had controversially eliminated all opposition to join Roadblock in our grand final. Tonight, one more robot will join them. Welcome the man who put scrap into metal, Jeremy Clarkson. Amid reports that robot wars are now breaking out all over the world, the European Union, with the backing of the United Nations, today announced that it would do everything in its power to halt the spread of this vicious and vile disease. They would rather we did a program on daffodils and bunny rabbits, but we're not going to. What we are going to do is get on with the Docklands Chainsaw Massacre and meet the six robots who tonight will compete for death or glory. First, from the University of East London, Cruella. It features computer-controlled regenerative braking and avoids wheel spin with Formula One-inspired traction control. Cruella weighs in at 81.2 kilograms and boasts a top speed of 15 miles an hour. From Borden in Hampshire, Blunderbird 1. Powered by a custom-built 12-volt engine, Blunderbird 1 worships Jerry Anderson. Travels at 7 miles an hour and carries a lethal array of interchangeable weapons pods. A deadly design. From Edmonton, Wizzy Wing. Nippy, zippy, and altogether dippy. What you see is what you get with this robot. Weighing in at 10.8 kilograms, this lightweight entry may surprise us all with its amazing acceleration and magnificent maneuverability. From Ipswich, Robot the Bruce. Don't let the transparent bodywork fool you. There's more to this robot than meets the eye. With a top speed of 4 miles an hour and weighing in at 84.6 kilos, Robot the Bruce is one of tonight's heaviest contenders. From London, Wedgehog. Featuring a deadly pickaxe, this middleweight entry clocks a top speed of 4 miles an hour. Wedgehog runs off two 9.6 volt domestic electric drills and weighs in with a power pack 24 kilograms. 
from Nuneaton, Dreadnought. Finally, the fiberglass protected Dreadnought runs off a 12 volt starter motor salvaged from a Morris Marina at five miles an hour. Not the fastest robot in the field, but certainly the heaviest, weighing in at 92.6 kilos. And what do you think about it all, Jeremy? They look strong and menacing now, but one of them will be going home in a dustbin after our first event. If they want the safe and, may I say, slightly boring route down the gauntlet tonight, our robots will choose the maze, but they've got to have a very good turning circle and lots of maneuverability. If they've got the ground clearance, they can choose the seesaw ramp and all the other ramps and bridges that dominate the middle of the course. If they've got enough aggression, then they will go to my left and be introduced to the horrific shunt, complete with pickaxe on the back. If they make it past him, and that's really not likely, then they'll meet dead metal, complete with pincers ready to clamp any unsuspecting robots. So many choices, so little time. So, if you go to the left, you get killed. If you go down the middle, you get stuck. And if you go to the right, it'll take a week. Rather you than me. <laughs> Robot ears, stand by. The first to take on the gauntlet, Cruella, driven by Philip Martin, with Kanish Lingham and Martin Smith from the University of East London. Three, two, one, activate. Cruella has the choice of three routes and immediately takes on the hardest, I would have thought, the house robot, Shunt, Philip Martin, the driver, plays solo euphonium in Tilbury Brass Band. He needs to blow his own trumpet a little bit here because Shunt has him foxed and boxed. This is Cruella. This is made by the Duelists, a team from the University of East London. And Cruella's designed to ram into the other robots and drive herself under them and flip them over. You can go through the metal things on Philip the Martin also likes to ride motorbikes and he's driving Cruella through those silver skittles with the power of two Sinclair C5s, they tell me. Goodness gracious me. Not quick enough for Shunt, though. And Shunt... And the axe has him on the spikes! Robots. Oh dear, what went wrong? What went wrong? I thought that was good. Well, it was good except for the rather important thing that you didn't cross the finishing line. We made good progress there. And what did you think of his driving? His driving is excellent. It's a very, very difficult robot he was up against there. Excellent driving, apparently. Well, there we are. Well done, anyway. You've got uh, some distance. Cruella, first to go and first on the leaderboard with 10.15 metres. Robot ears, stand by. The Dreadnought team, Ken Feltwell and David Bowles, brothers-in-law, both work in design and technology. Three, two, one, activate. And the Dreadnought's greatest asset here, driven by the brothers-in-law, Ken and David, could be its weight. It looks like a big slug. Our team is Blade Runner, this is our machine, Dreadnought. It's a heavyweight robot, and our feature of attack is these forks at the front here, which are operated like this. the strength of that Morris starter motor engine. Takes on dead metal. Now it needs to kick the pace. Stuck there, and the house robots close in. Good run! They're through all the way! Oh, just for a minute, I thought you were going to get pushed all the way back. I thought, I thought we were as well. I was a bit worried there, but we managed it. I was amazed. We did it. <laughs> Made it and you threw. Congratulations. And there's confirmation, Treadlock through, completing the course, ahead of Cruella in second. Oh, but hang on a minute, what's this? Treadnought's blown some sort of a fuse, it's on fire! And this could be major, major trouble, they'll have to repair this quickly, otherwise they could be forced to retire, and that would give someone else a chance! Well, we don't know, it, 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 after, we, after we got through and stopped, we just saw the smoke coming out of it. Oh, Couldn't get the main switch to turn off, so we had to take the top off, and all the wire was smelling, smoking. Still a bit of excitement. <laughs> we might need this. <laughs> Robot ears, stand by. The Plunderbird One team, Mike Onslow, John Dilly, and Brian Kilburn, whose ambition it is to meet the rock band Aerosmith. Three, two, one, activate. <laughs> And certainly the best dressed gentleman on Robot Wars get us off and underway with Blunderbird 1. The weaponry could be deadly, but not against Shunt. On the grill, stuck against the pyramid. And they'll need some work to get out of there. We are the International Rep crew. This is the Blunderbird 1. We've built the system around 
separate weapons pods. The first one has a battering ram with a laser guided sight. Second pod has a circular saw which will flip out like this when it's operational and do some nice chopping up. We intend to kick some butt with this and be afraid there's a plunderstorm coming. At the moment, Blunderbird! Blunderbird! One, two, in, out, in, out. And Blunderbird is being hacked and is on the rack. And deactivate robots. Now, 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 beforehand you told me you were just going to barge them out the way. Well, they're obviously a bit too heavy and we just didn't quite manage it. But we will be back and we will get them next time. Mm, maybe, but only 4.81 metres leaves Plunderbird vulnerable. Guys, that was very nearly Plunderbird's our not go. Um, yes, well, we don't really don't want to win by someone else's misfortune, but it doesn't make us happy to be through because someone else blew up, does it, guys? No. No. Do you think it's likely that you can repair this for the next round? Otherwise, you're out and Plunderbird's in. We're, we're trying. We're going to do it. We're, we're starting to work on it now. Robot ears, stand by. The WYSIWYG team, Michelle Wheelie, a big football fan. She supports Arsenal. Three, two, one, activate. So come on, Michelle Wheelie, one of our rare female volunteers. If she takes on the maze to the left there, that would be rare indeed. Very few do. Seems to me she's stuck on the ramp now with that low ground clearance. And I think shunt is too, and that's very rare. That hasn't happened before. This is my robot WYSIWYG, which basically stands for what you see is what you get. It's made out of wood, which means it's quite light, can move quite fast. It's wedge-shaped, so it can hopefully tip up the other robots. But I think I'm going to have to stay out of the way of the house robots. And still they remain stuck. Dead Metal's going in to give them a bit of a shunt behind shunt itself. Now what you see is a young woman driver, and what you get... Ah, right. Come on, Michelle. Let's get it right. Take on that fence. Go on. Uh, go on. No, Michelle, you're supposed to go round it. And deactivate robots. Oh, dear me, now, what on earth happened there? It was a slaughter. <laughs> it was a slaughter, except you actually managed to get a house robot stuck, which is an all-time first. Yeah, I feel pretty good, actually. <laughs> OK, well, you managed to go the wrong way, but nevertheless some way. And what we see is what she's got. Triumph. Well done, Michelle and WYSIWYG. She's through. Plunderbird and Nervy. But they still could go through if Dreadnought is ruled out. You still don't know yet. You must be keeping your fingers crossed secretly. Secretly, we do a lot of things, but we couldn't tell you that. Robot ears, stand by. The Wedgehog team. Teenagers Chris Glaster and Joe Wentworth, both students studying computers and engineering. Three. Two, one, activate. 19-year-old Chris Glaster drives Wedgehog with the electric drill, two 9.6-volt engines, and taking on the maze. This will need some tricky control and some clever driving. We've built this robot called Wedgehog. Wedgehog's powered by two domestic drills here. It's got a weapon, which is a pickaxe. They're through the maze, and here come the pneumatic drills, pushed by shunt, deadly towards Wedgehog, around the springs. Now, this is the surprise, so I'm not too sure whether they've read this right. They need to get their drive wheel motoring up and over the spikes. Dead metal awaits, that's the house robot there in the bottom of your picture, and they're impaled and in pain. Deactivate robots. Well, not a bad performance there. But tell me, what do you think of those spikes there? A uh, bit of trouble lifting up the drive wheel so we can get any drive forward, but we got far enough. There we are, I reckon you're through, and that's important. That'll do for me. 13.23 metres sees Wedgehog through in second place so far. Robot ears, stand by. And the final team to take on the gauntlet, Robot the Bruce with George Francis and Mick Cutter. They both fly model aeroplanes. Three, two, one, activate. Robot the Bruce in its sexy see-through gear. Very heavy, 84.6 kilos, driven by a team. They call themselves the Village Idiots. They're no idiots. They're very clever electric engineers. 
Look at the power. No weapons there, just brute force. Uh, robot, robot the Bruce. As you can see, the robot is built with no special armaments. We're purely relying on a lot of weight. We're in the heavyweight category. And just brute power and a lot of traction and push people out of the way. Great strength. George Francis, the driver, is building a single-engine aeroplane driven by a car engine. It's a bit of a worry. But this isn't worrying. That's strong. Good run. They're through. Now, of all the driving I think I've ever seen in here, that was just about the best. No problem. Easy as anything. Now, that was a hell of a performance. Well done. Robot the Bruce impressively through. Top of the leaderboard. Blunderbird heading out unless the Dreadnought engine has failed. They've run the gauntlet, but now time is running out. They've got to be back in that arena very soon for the trials. So will they be ready? Dreadnought! Guys, how have you got on? Well, we've got it working again. We've had to take out the motor that we used for thought lifts and put it in as a drive motor, because the other one's shorted out. It's uh, completely gone. So we've now not got any uh, defense attack mechanism. So we, we've tried to adjust it so it's now more defensive. We can actually try and scoop the ball up and use it to, to move the football. OK, so it might do you some favors. Well, hopefully. <laughs> You're in. That's the That's amazing. right. We've made it. We Best didn't think we would, but we've done it. Violence has largely been eradicated from football, but tonight, we're going to put it back. If you score in this game of robotic soccer, you're removed from the arena, safe in the knowledge that you're through to the next round. But scoring isn't that easy, because the goal's defended by dead metal. And if you get too close to these scissors, it really will be a game of two halves. Now, obviously, at the end of the day, one robot won't have scored, and they'll get the red card. They'll be sent off permanently. You got that, guys? You clear? Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one. Activate. Is dead metal our scorpion goalkeeper shaking with fear? Don't forget the ball. Don't forget the ball. That's a little bit more like it. Oh, good save by dead metal. Get it away. Magnificent stuff. There's big Dreadnought in there. And Robot the Bruce for that sheer power through to the edge of the goal area. Can he get the last chance to keep us beaten? Go on, go on! It's there! Hey, that was fantastic. It wasn't quite as easy as it looked. Got there in the end. You're the first one, though. That's all right. Round of applause, take a bow. Three, two, one, activate. The robots starting from their finishing position from the last attack. WYSIWYG is busy. Almost looks dwarfed out there. Wedgehog first to it, and Cruella. Nice bit of ball control by Cruella. Oh, go on, WYSIWYG, that deserves a yellow card. Terrific challenge. Magnificent stuff. Oh, she's glad to the goalkeeper now. This is great stuff. Go on, get in there. Look at that! Get out of the way, Dreadnought. What is Dreadnought doing? I think Dreadnought's a bit of a goal hanger here. WYSIWYG, out of it. Here's Wedgehog. Good control by Wedgehog, too. Can he finish? It's an open goal. He's got to score here. But who did score? Well, very interesting. Let's have a look at the replay. It was Wedgehog that got the deflection. Over the line, surely. Now, what would you say? Would you say that was luck? It was luck, but also the extra panels on the side of the robot controlling the ball throughout the thing, but at the end I got wedged on the side, lost control. Bit of a luck that it bounced off me on the way in. But... Three, two, one. Eight. Three left. No, I'm not too sure if Dreadnought is goal hanging. I think he's suffering a reoccurrence of that old injury. Can't move hardly. WYSIWYG tigerish again in there. With Cruella first to it. And perhaps using these surround walls to ricochet it in. Dead metal. Poorly placed at the moment. WYSIWYG. Oh, <laughs> Take it on the goalkeeper. Hey, get some of that. She crashes against the post. Dreadnought's dead. And that's in from Cruella! 
He's through to the semi-final, and that's Sporting. Please make your own one for Andrew Booth, Cruella from the arena. Cruella lived up to her name then, didn't oh, she? Oh, yes. She's difficult to drive. It's it's not easy. Somebody said it was um, a bit like an Arsenal defender. What do you say to that? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't like to say. <laughs> so, down to the last two. Uh, but I've been told now they've both broken down. It goes to the judges. Although Wiggy Wiggs and Dreadlock failed to score, the robot with most touches of the ball was Dreadlock. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle. Big commiserations. Perhaps nobody explained that in a game of football you have to actually sometimes aim at the ball. <laughs> well, because they're all much bigger than me, I just had to try and get in some way. If they didn't get out my way, I bashed them out my way. I thought that would be worth something anyway. Yes, it's worth a trip home. Um, Ken, how do you feel? Because you thought you really had had it. We did, actually, yes. I mean, after the first round, we went up in smoke. We really didn't think we would be even into this round. So we just chuffed to bits to actually get through. Well, that's marvellous. Congratulations. Well done. How on earth have Dreadnought survived again? Wizzy rigged out, but she gave us great entertainment value, Michelle. You are getting through by the skin of your teeth, aren't right. you? Hanging by a thread, yes. After we went up in this fight, we really didn't think we were getting no. into that round. We're and that, the, the battery charge. Say that again? We just didn't get the battery charged in time. Yeah. It just went dead in there. It was just the fact that the others actually hit the ball into us that gave us the touches. <laughs> so we feel a bit of a cheat, really. So at the end of the soccer, let's see how they did. Wizzywick sadly has many battle scars, but it was good to see you. Cruella's through. Wedgehog just about to wade it through. Now, Dreadnought, guys, you've still got a lot of work to do, haven't you? Yes, we have a bit, yeah. Better get cracking on with it, I think. Yeah, you had better get cracking as well. There's a fight to, still to come. And, uh, excuse me, you two look very smug. Yes, we're all sitting here all cool, know we've done the business and ready for the next round. So four robots are now through the trials. They're back here in the pits, preparing and repairing for the semi-finals. Guys, last time we saw you were having all sorts of problems. Are they still there, those problems? We don't think so. We think we've finally cracked it. Let me tell you who you're pitched against in the final battle. Who would be the worst person? Um, probably Robot the Bruce, I think. It's pretty impregnable, that one. OK, it's good news then. It's Wedgehog. Is it? Oh. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll be lucky to survive five minutes with anybody anyway, so uh, <laughs> we're just thankful. Who would you hate to be pitched again? Um, any of them. I don't mind. We'll take all of them. And does that apply to you as well? You can take all of them? Oh, yes, definitely. We've got the power, and we know we've uh, got a reliable robot, so we just um, hit them and push them out of the way. OK, let me tell you who you are pitched against in the next event. It's Cruella. No problem. <laughs> be an easy one. Let's go and find out what they say. That's a frightener, that one. <laughs> Why? Well, it's very tough. It's got a lot of power, a lot of torque, a lot of weight. Uh, very dangerous. As we draw closer to the grand final, we still have the formality of deciding tonight's winner. Now, as usual, the Roboteers will go out there and attempt to send their opponents over the bridge and into the next life before the whistle is blown. If both are still running at the end of the bout, we shall turn to our adjudicators, Eric Dickinson, Noel Sharkey, who claims to be a rock and roll guitarist, and Adam Harper, who claims to be single. Now, they'll be looking for damage, aggression, control, and style. They will not tolerate retreat. Retreat, and you will get eaten by one of the house robots, or eliminated from the round completely. Or, if I have anything to do with it, both. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one, activate. It's the box against the wedge. No on board either, both charged by two large Claire C5 motors. If Cruella can get in underneath Robot the Bruce, there could be a shock here. Robot the Bruce will be using that fast, near 85 kilogram power to shove it into one of the patrol zones, or against the spikes, or against the grills. Oh, that's suicide, surely! What on earth is Philip Martin doing? He's on the grill, he won't get out from there now.
I thought he'd got you there. I thought he's going to be able to tip you over. Nearly, yeah. It wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. But how did you manage to get him to run away onto that grate? Uh, pass. He just committed suicide? I think so. Doesn't matter, though. You're through. Well done. Just at the edge of the uh, arena, there's a horizontal metal grill, and we lost the ground clearance and got jammed under the metal grill that's above it. But what were you doing going onto the metal grill? Well, it's very difficult to control the machine, this. Isn't that a fatal flaw? I'm afraid so, <laughs> yes. It, it, in more ways than one, because the flaw was fatal to our robot. <laughs> Not quite sure how, but we won. <laughs> It was looking a bit dodgy there at it the start. You were nearly wedged up. That's right, yes. Sort of lifted off the ground a few times, but got there in the end, though. Yeah, you did. It's fantastic. And not that much We've damage. Got a little bit of battle damage on the right hand side the there, but repairable. Got there in the end, though. Roboteers, stand by. Three, two, one. Dreadnought, the big slug against Wedgehog, the piece of cheese, and the Dreadnought boys look worried. They know they have to get this over and done with very early because the motor may not last. They're still in there. There's smoke. There's smoke from Dreadnought. It's gone again, the engine. And surely this is Wedgehog's semi final now. He's smoking. That's it. It's over. It is. Well, so well Wedgehog done. is your opponent. Yep. There shouldn't be any problem, I don't think. We'll wait and see. <laughs> oh, God, so confident. Chaps, you've won, and that's what matters, but I've got to ask, that toothpick you fitted to the front, it's pathetic. <laughs> oh, give us a break. <laughs> it is, but Dreadnought, I mean, really, the whole event has been on fire or broken down. You must have been relieved when you were drawn against it. We were happy to see the smoke coming out, yeah. Because <laughs> <Yeah, so. laughs> there was a while when you were going to get pushed on that grate, it all looked like it was over. Yeah, but we managed to get off. Um, took out so I think Bash's circular saw, which is good. She gets some points. You do get points. You get through to the next round, where it'll be mended. Go on, see you later. Hey, guys. It's a bit of a bash in there, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, they took it out on it. They tried the hardest. Are you disappointed? Did you think you'd get this far? No, I didn't think we'd get this far, well, especially after out. the burnt out and then getting into the football. I thought we'd, we'd finish at the football, but we've gone that far and we've, we tried. Wedgehog, what is your strategy going to be? Um, try and make him run up the front. We've got no chance any other way. He's, he weighs four times our weight. Fairly certain he won't get through the armour, but we'll have a go. Are you nervous at all? Uh, a little bit. I didn't do too well against the last wedge one. It took a bit of doing. So uh, I'm not sure. We'll see. And so we have reached tonight's final, which is between Robot the Bruce in its see-through negligee and Wedgehog with its very deadly toothpick. You ready, guys? Yeah, we're ready. You ready? Yep. Get in your boxes and do fighting. Oh, God knows how with a see through box. There we are. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one. Eight. Robot the Bruce with George Francis and Mick Cutter against Wedgehog with Chris Glaser and Hugo Elias. Sheer brute force against the toothpick. <laughs> it could all be over very, very quickly. He's on the grill. I don't think he's going to get out of there. Are you sure taking on a grill with that thing? And the house robots are closing in for the kill as well. The sergeant with the circular saw. Shunt is in there too. There's the saw blade. I don't think they're going to get out. Matilda's in, looking for a few scraps, as usual. Shunt takes on Robot the Bruce, but I think it's too little, too late. Robot the Bruce is the winner. All right, Shunt, quieten down, quieten down. You did very well. No need for a judge's decision tonight, is there? The winner, Robot the Bruce. That was just great. Congratulations. Magnificent. Well done. Brilliant stuff. Were you not even slightly worried about that very, very lethal toothpick? No. I was more worried about a chainsaw on the back of the Matilda. 
Yeah, well, everybody's right about the train sir. I can't wait to see the damage that's been inflicted down there. I can't wait to see you at the end of the series for our grand final. Thank you very much. See you next week. No, not in the slightest. We never thought we'd get here. Okay, that was a good fight. That was a fantastic fight. How did you manage against Matilda? I thought you were going to have her at one point. That was good fun, that was. Hardly even damaged it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the man who gets heavy with the metal, Jeremy Clarkson. In a desperate bid to bring peace once again to this set to dial, the USS Nimitz today arrived off the coast with her full complement of F-14 fighters. Now, ordinarily, the might of the US Navy's flagship would be no match for the robots on Robot Wars, but tonight, things are a little different. Tonight, it's a lightweight special where all the robots weigh less than 12 kilograms. They're small, but don't worry, they're still vicious. So let's go and meet the only machines in the world that are brave enough to spill Prince Nassim's pint. First, from Romford, Victor of Armageddon. And the riders of the Apocalypse team, driven by two 14.4 volt motors, and has the same speed controller as used for bomb disposal robots. From Milton Keynes, Crazy Tokyo. This school design robot based in Tokyo is very light at 3.2 kilograms and apparently is driven by a teddy bear. Has a top speed of 12 miles an hour and a zero turning circle. From the University of Reading, Cunning Plan. Designed by a Star Wars fan, but Cunning Plan looks nothing like R2-D2 or as frightening as an Imperial Starfighter, a defensive wedge with an aluminium steel shell. From Billericay, Saturn. Built by Essex schoolboys, those Saturn pointed horns are made of shelving brackets bolted together. But a turning circle of a sluggish three meters could leave these hopes blunted. From Chesson School, Bugs. A GCSE school project, the front of Bugs is fashioned as an aluminium ramming wedge. And at 40 centimeters, Bugs is the tallest robot in our starting lineup. From London, the Demolisher. With licensed stealth technology so undetectable by enemy radar, the demolisher's obviously too quick for its own good. Quickest in the field at 40 miles an hour, and also the smallest at an itsy bitsy 60 centimeters. Back to you, Jeremy. Remember, some of the deadliest creatures in the woods are also the smallest. The song thrush, the earwig, the hedgehog. Let's see what's what with the first event. First of all, you have to exit the carousel, which isn't easy, even for me. And then it's decisions, decisions, decisions. Do you take the safe but rather slow route to my right, which involves a maze and some spikes, or the middle ramp route, which also has its ups and downs? Or do you face Sergeant Bash, complete flamethrower? Whatever you do, by the time you get to this end, you better watch out because Matilda has the freedom to roam across the whole of the finish line. And her tail just happens to be a chainsaw, so you don't want to get on the wrong end of her. There's also the pendulum to look out for. But whatever route you decide to take, the worst performer is eliminated. So, let's find out who it's going to be. Roboteer, start your battery. Roboteers, stand by. First to take on the gauntlet is Cunning Plan with Oliver Steeples, a fourth-year engineering student. His hero is Star Wars creator George Lucas. This is Cunning Plan. It's basic wedge design. It's got an aluminium and steel body shell for overturning and ramming other robots. Three, two, one, activate. Out comes Cunning Plan. Small, quick, darts into the maze with that Zero degrees turning circle, which could be so vital here for the faster featherweight machines. He is Joe 90, isn't he, Oliver Steeples? And basically, these smaller robots have to dodge anything. The house robots could take them out, 
Certainly the drills could. And Matilda, out to splatter a small fry. She's a darling, isn't she, Matilda? Models on my mum. Oh. That's good manoeuvrability, but again, crunch, you see. He's got to dodge it onto the spikes here. He'll wait until the spikes go down. And then spurt on. Good run by Cunning Plan. Appropriate name, Cunning Plan. Maybe. You were uh, looking pretty pleased there. Uh, the spikes are a bit tricky. The uh, robot didn't give me any problems. What, the, the spikes are tricky, but Matilda isn't? Well, I'm looking forward to you going head-to-head -head with that. Should be good luck. Well done. Anytime. Cunning plan, first to go, first to complete, and first name up on the leaderboard. Robot ears, stand by. Kevin Church, Matthew Davy, and Chris Purchase, all GCSE students. Three, two, one, activate. Crazy Tokyo boys all studying for GCSEs. <laughs> what on earth have they made this thing from? One of its weapons is that curved bumper they say to push opponents out of the way. It seems to me to have been made out of one of those stickers you get in bubblegum packets. Past the drill, stuck on the grill, and the drill again, could get mangled there. It's a, a case of run away, run away. Taking on the springs. This is Crazy Tokyo in the featherweight division. This armor plating is impenetrable to chainsaws and other pokey things. We will see. Here come two pokey things now. Matilda's tusks. And is Crazy Tokyo stuck on those springs? Oh, is Matilda stuck on those springs? You are. And so is Matilda stuck fast. And Matilda's in trouble. Look at that. And deactivates Robox. Well, you were lucky there because you were about to be eaten. Right. Did you find that in a dustbin or make it? Bye. <laughs> You're supposed to have gone that way, past that enormous house robot which would have mangled your piece of litter, but you went the other way around and deservedly got stuck. Oh, never mind. <laughs> well, never mind. But the bin boys did well. 12.65 metres, they're in second place. Robot ears, stand by. Satan, driven by 15-year-old GCSE schoolboy Tom Barber. His brother, 13-year-old Sam, is back in the pits. This is our robot Satan based on a ball. We've got a number of different features. We've got wagon tail at the back, sound effects. We've got smoke machines in the nose and a laser for the eye. Three, two, one. And what Tom and Sam Barber didn't tell you is that Satan also moves as it goes along. Mad cow disease. These boys are bonkers already. Moves, that's a few bruises, too many. I'm not too sure about the steering with that mad one eye, but it certainly is bullish. Oh, what a great run straight through! Look at the maneuverability in 10 mile an hour speed past the house robots. I cannot believe you beat both of them. Oh, brilliant. That was... Yeah, that was brilliant. Well done. And Satan through in the quickest time so far. Top of the leaderboard. Crazy Tokyo, 12.65 meters. Looks vulnerable. Robot ears, stand by. Driver Sam Rudgard is the youngest competitor in Robot Wars. He's only 10. This is the Demolisher. It's made from a Tyco engine and it's built for speed. It spikes here made for when zooming around to ram into the enemy and puncture its armour. Three, two, one, activate. And ten-year-old Sam Rudgard with the smallest robot in Robot Wars no, you, so far. He's speeding away and it's beaten just about everything and has! That's taking the Michael! Not that long ago, I'd have put some money on you not making it, yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, guys. That was a really neat run. Well done.
the Demolisher very quick, but not as quick as Satan or Cunning Plan. Roboteers, stand by. Bugs, driven by Michael Stacy, technician Stephen Devereaux to the left, and Michael Langdon, their Chesnut school teacher, to the right. Three, two, one. Activate. And for me, driver Michael, technician Stephen, and teacher, chief mechanic Michael Langdon have built one of the most attractive robots in Robot Wars. Bugs, from the Chesnut school. This is a Bugs. And this is our design, loosely based on a ladybird. Nice and light, nice and agile, nice and fast. We get up to four miles an hour. Actually, looks like it's built out of my vacuum cleaner at home. Good steering and dodging. But now comes the crunch and Matilda. So lightweight, these smaller robots. Impaled on the spikes, Matilda gives it a right clout. If in doubt, clout it out, Matilda. Michael Stacy, the driver, waiting his moment now to dodge past the house robot. Don't forget, the worst performer goes out of the competition. Dodges Matilda again. Stop the activate robots. Well, I reckon Sergeant Bash had a hangover, don't you reckon? Oh, well, we just couldn't get through. <laughs> you made every effort, for which you should be heartily congratulated but not good enough to go beyond Crazy Tokyo's distance. Bugs fifth, 11.45 meters to beat for Vector of Armageddon. Robot ears, stand by. Last to go then, Adam Clark, who was once upon a time a mechanic at the Isle of Man TT motorbike races. This is the Vector of Armageddon competing in the featherweight class. It's designed around a brute force design with Lexan body armor on the front, high power torch for targeting purposes, and it's built on power. Three. Two, one, activate. Adam Clark and Vector of Armageddon. Which way is he gonna go? Well, he attacks the first ramp, which is bold, because this has got a maximum climb of 35 degrees, this robot. Maneuvering it well up and over the first ramp. Now, if he gets up and over the second ramp, he'll have done enough. He'll have beaten bugs and he will go through which way is he going now, though? Very cautious. And stuck on that second ramp. Only a ground clearance of one millimeter, and I think that's costing him here. He may not get up and over, and time is running out. Stop and deactivate robots. So, let, I've got to ask, did Sergeant Bash burn out your communications? No, it was just beached on the uh, second ramp. It looks like the lip between the ground and the ramp was just too steep for it to get up. I know it looks like a grass cutting box, but it's serious robot, though, isn't it? Yeah, it was, it's designed for very extreme ground clearance, and the ramp's just too steep for it, unfortunately. Are you gutted? Yeah, for this time. Yeah. Well done, anyway. He makes rockets in his spare time, Adam Clark. He's rocketing out of Robot Wars. Bugs team, how bad was your damage? Very slight. We'll make it through. Of course you will. Keep going. It's the end of event one, and uh, things have to be repaired here. Demolisher had a very exciting round. Saturn had the fastest time going, and, uh, ooh, how's it going here? Um, all right. We're just putting a weapon on it, like this, and it will stop our uh, stab things. Okay, well, good luck with that. And, Oliver, you... you've got the hammer out, then? Yeah, I've got a bit of a dent to my robot. Take your aggression out on that. While the robots prepare for those trials, let's take a look at some action from Robot Wars around the world. Well, we don't have to travel too far, Jeremy. We'll revisit the 1995 UK Robot Wars Championships in London, featuring two of the most powerful robots in the world today. The Master, built by Mark Satrakian, and Thor, designed by Schilling Robotics, both from America. What a night it was. Here's Thor's hammer, and there's surely a killing blow! Smashing right to the heart of the hydraulic cabling! And Thor will be severely damaged and severely limited after that. I think I can see hydraulic fluid already pumping out. Oh, comes back down there with a hammer blow onto the top of the saw. The saw's already been blunted, and there is the hydraulic fluid pouring out and splattering the floor of the arena. It's getting skinny and slippery, and in comes the master again. He sent some weak point there right about the jugular vein, and Thor doesn't seem to have too much left to offer except vital engine blood and guts and gore, and he's out of it. 
And the master is surely one of the most powerful robots in the world, and for me, the star of the 1995 UK London Robot Wars. Now for some motor racing where pit stops are banned but ramming is actively encouraged. It's a sport that could have been designed specifically for Michael Schumacher. Now the grid positions for our five remaining robots were decided after studying their form in the gauntlet. It's a three lap race around this figure of eight course and the one that crosses the line last or covers the least distance is eliminated. Unless of course they were sensible enough to give the government a million pounds. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one, activate. I thought Crazy Tokyo got away with a false start, but we're off and running. Demolisher is flipped, and he's in trouble. He's okay again, though. Helped out there by Cunning Plan. Let's have a look at the start again. Yes, he's off to a false start, Crazy Tokyo, but we're off and running. And Demolisher is already recovering from that flip, and he's really buzzing now. Back in the race, and taking lead position. Ahead of Saturn, and look at the pace now of the Demolisher. Up to 40 miles an hour, completing the first lap. Saturn is stuck. Demolisher off and running through the middle. Crazy Tokyo is stuck by Saturn, but it's Demolisher setting the pace. And through for a second lap already, and the others are trailing in its wake. Back down the centre stretch, around the final corner. It could all be over here. Oh my goodness me! He's flipped. It's flipped over the demolisher, too lightweight, let's have a look at it again, too cocky by half, and he took the corner too tight. Now what's going to happen, because they can't write it, and meanwhile, cunning plan, oh, until then, was being quite cunning, I thought, but he's making up ground very, very slowly. Cunning plan is through, Tokyo Joe seems out of it to me, cunning plan, now, looks like he could take advantage of demolisher's problem, he's around that final corner, don't forget, it's all over after three laps. Will Demolisher go out, or has it done enough? He could certainly still block Cunning Plan, and Cunning Plan seems to want to push him over the line. Don't forget, it'll finish when Cunning Plan crosses this line, which I'm sure he will do in first position. But I think the Demolisher might have done enough, and that's all over. The race stops now. Oh, no, no, no. The one that looks like a dustbin or something is out. And you jumped the start. Come on. It wasn't my fault. Well, whose fault was it? Father Christmas's? It's whoever's got the other controller on the same frequency. That's the worst excuse I've ever heard in my entire life. You, on the other hand, you won it and tried to get that one back on its wheels. Yeah, after the first two laps, I lost count, so I thought I'd go around again, and I saw it, so I thought, why not? Give it a go. You'd actually help someone, even though they might be able to beat you. That's the way you go, isn't it? Oh, it's just such a nice sport, this caring and sharing. I've got to come to you. Can I just squeeze in here? I've just got to ask, this robot you've designed here, what's it called? Demolisher. Demolisher, but it only ever demolishes itself in the gauntlet. It got upside down and it did the same here. It's got a bit of a personality complex at times. It just gets a bit carried away. But it isn't half quick. Very. And you're still lost. <laughs> the way it goes sometimes. Well, anyway, well done. It looks great, like that marooned. But the demolisher covered enough ground to go through. Crazy Tokyo didn't, and they're out. And after that mind-blowing first race, both should get extra points for being cute, I think. And Gary, demolisher is fantastic, but a bit too quick. Definitely too quick, but I think we'll correct that in the future and slow it down a bit. Congratulations on coming second, guys. Well done. And disappointment all round here. Yes, we're very disappointed, but it was beyond our control. We can't really help it. <laughs> Is that you losing well? Um, yes, we're losing very well, but we're fixing it up just in case they need us. And before we move on to tonight's semi-finals, let's take another trip down memory lane, this time visiting the American 1996 finals, which take place in the birthplace of Robot Wars, San Francisco in August every year. We join the action in one of the final melees of that live event, and it's worthwhile reminding ourselves that Robot Wars has been huge in America for five years. Let's just sit back and enjoy the action and watch out for the master in action again there. But this time, Mark Satrakian, a designer who's worked on great movies like Men in Black, is on his home arena. The 
the ultimate winner here, La Machine, dumping that one over the edge. Undisputed world champion for two years until losing its crown to an even meaner killing machine. But now the face-off battles. And you don't know who you're pitched against, do you? No. Who would you like to be pitched against? I'm not bothered. Anyone. <laughs> bugs. It's Bugs against Cunning Clan. Oliver, what weapons have you got that can oppose Bugs? I've got a sticker. Disappointed we can't squash a bug first. <laughs> <laughs> but do you so think you can squash this one? We're going to give it a good, good, uh, good tryout. So yeah, we'll test him. But how do you think Saturn will fare? Um, pretty well, I think. It's a lot bigger. Um, it's got more power behind it. You're on your way to your arena with Cunning Plan. I have something to ask you. You met C-3PO and R2-D2. Did they inspire you? No. He's very nervous. It must have inspired you a little bit. If I may liken this show to a cup of cappuccino, we've now reached the point where the froth is gone. It's neat wake-up juice from now on in. Our four remaining robots will have a fight to the death as they compete for a place in the grand finals at the end of the series. Now, at the end of each bout, if there's no clear winner, well, our panel of adjudicators will make a decision based on four criteria. Damage, aggression, style, and control. And these guys know what they're talking about. On the left, we have Eric Dickinson, who's the only British veteran of robot wars in America. In the centre, there's Professor Noel Sharkey, head of robotics at Sheffield University. And on the right, Adam Harper, holder of the land speed record at 150 miles an hour in a Sinclair C5. He's crazy, but not as crazy as what's about to happen below me. Robot ears, stand by. Three. Two, one, activate. So basically cutting plan with the defensive wedge to batter Bugs itself. That little aluminium ramming wedge in the front there. You dancing? I'm asking. You asking? I'm dancing. Come on, get stuck in. Oh, that's better. Underneath Bugs. Cunning plan, you don't want to get on that grill! Oh no, you won't get out from there! You will not get out of there, Bugs! I didn't think it had the maneuverability that we saw earlier. There could be a problem. Perhaps dead metal. Oh! Those pincers could crush the life out of the bug. Could actually dead metal knock it back into play? I don't think so. Cease. Well, it looks like you threw the first semi-final. How does that feel? Good. Didn't put up much of a fight, did it? It was good. I like it. Like what? Bugs. Look at the paint job. You've got to like it. Yeah, the paint job's great, but it ran onto a grate and then capitulated immediately, and you just ran around in the middle looking silly. I had to go to big ones. <laughs> well, well done anyway. You're through to the next round. Congratulations. Yes, well done, Cunning Plan and Oliver through to the final, but I just wonder what did happen with Bugs, whether there was a problem. Bugs team, what happened there? We had caster on it, and we changed it, and it was, um, loose. We, 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 it worked better with this one on it, that was, um, steel. So, we changed it at the last minute, and now we lost. How do you feel? Guide. <laughs> Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one. Activate. Sat on like a bull rushes at the demolisher. Oh, you silly moo, you've missed him. <laughs> the demolisher's pace will simply carry it away from you like that. Got to get in to crush the demolisher against one of the house robots, and that's what they're trying to do. And young Shamrock Garb, we told, I would imagine, to keep out of trouble. Get away from everything. Run away to fight another day. What can the Barber Boys do with Saturn? Demolishers flipped on its side. 
and again rights itself away from Matilda. Oh, the enemy to the sandwich! And Matilda saw comes down! Satan is being chewed! Slowly! Oh, look at that! It's been saved by its opponent, the Demolisher! Unbelievable stuff! Down comes the saw, and it's the titanium shell of the Demolisher that saves it! And surely I think the Demolisher has done enough here! Shut on, disarm, and out. And Samurai got only ten. Look at that walking tall. Demolishes one. Yeah, I was surprised. But secretly quite pleased. Maybe. We'll see you later. Unbelievable! Put it there. That was epic. You have a laugh? Yeah. Did you see what happened to the other one? Hmm. Just got cut in half by Matilda's chainsaw, basically. Yeah, and you just spent the whole time running away. Is that what you asked him to do? Yep, that's our strategy. Keep out of trouble. Yeah, you think he did a good job? Excellent job. He did indeed. He's through to the next round. No weapons at all, but you can make it. Well done. <laughs> this damage look at this damage that's what miss hilda did that's incredible what else it broke down so it went, just there, went there was a connection right. it's come off so we had problems with it yesterday <laughs> now in the stock car racing cunning plan actually tried to rescue demolisher that's not going to be happening in the final you guys ready you ready get in your positions let's get cracking Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one. Activate. Demolisher, the top of your picture is the quicker, but Cunning Plan is the heavier of these two featherweights. The Demolisher will be trying to keep out of trouble with Young Sam and the wheels. Oh, but the wheels have come off. See. The Demolisher is beaten by the Six. cunning plan of Oliver Steeples. I'm not too sure whether the crowd wanted young Sam Rudgard to win it, but he had no chance with power like that. Oliver Steeples is the winner. Well, now, that was a hugely long final. Was that worked out? I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it to go a bit longer. But, but you're through and it doesn't matter and congratulations, we'll see you in the grand final at the end of the series. We'll see you next week. Don't have nightmares. Good night. Sam, what happened to you? Well, I was trying to get away but I just got caught by the edge of the... Um... I mean, how, did, how did you feel? Oh, a bit sad. <sighs> next year. Um, maybe next year. Definitely next year. Well done, you did very well to get this far. One day, somebody opened up the shell of an oyster and found inside what appeared to be a large globule of phlegm. But instead of throwing it away, he ate it. And he discovered that it was not only delicious, but also that it was an aphrodisiac. Well, I have the same amount of respect for the man who looked at his remote control car and said, I know, I'll armor plate that and use it to bash into other armor-plated remote control cars. It may not have resulted in an urgent need to have sex, but he had invented Robot Wars. Now, those of you who've been with us from the start will know that we already have four robots in next week's grand final, and tonight, six more are fighting it out for a chance to take them on. 
Let's meet them. First, from Biggleswade, Warthog. Lemon yellow and driven by an electric 24-watt wheelchair control unit. Has a huge turning circle of two meters and a ground clearance of only five millimeters. I hope that'll be enough. From Ludlow, Psycho Sprout. A truly unique design. A three-foot fiberglass sphere that rolls along through gravity. Weighing in at 24.3 kilograms, and of course it has zero ground clearance. From Gloucester, Body Hammer. A copper-colored cone, looks a little bit like a coal scuttle, powered by four 18-volt domestic drill motors, weighing in at 78.9 kilograms, quite heavy, but also quite nippy at nine miles an hour. From Haverford West, Talk of the Dead. A witty name and a witty frame. Sculpted out of fiberglass, Talk of the Devil, weighs in at 57.9 kilos and powered by a 12-volt electric motor. From Worcester, reality. This looks like an alien UFO, complete with colored flashing lights and a siren. It's powered by six 90-watt motors and has hardened steel spikes. From Morden, full metal anorak. And the final competitor, wedge-shaped, comes equipped with that garish grin and a tire-cutting blade. Only 28.5 kilos, but at 12 miles an hour, could be the fastest here tonight, Jeremy. A motley collection there. Some of them have weapons so secret they're still at home on the kitchen table. Still, let's find out how they get on in the first event. As ever, the first event is the gauntlet, the most fearsome fighting terrain known to man or robot. It's been cunningly designed so that there are any number of ways to get through, but there are also lots of hidden surprises for unsuspecting robots, like these corkscrew lances. And they may not survive if they stumble in the path of any one of our three, yes, three house robots defending the cause tonight. They are Matilda, Sergeant Bash, and Death Metal. In fact, you'll probably get a good mangling from them. Now, survival is everything. The worst performer is out straight away and no one wants to face that disappointment so early on, so let the sparks fly. Right, the gauntlet. Let's get on with it. Our first Roboteer. Roboteers, stand by. First to take on the gauntlet with Full Metal Anorak, Paul Baxter, who loves to go pro kart racing. Meet Full Metal Anorak. My name's Paul Baxter, Team Anorexia. Its main feature is this tyre cutting blade for anybody silly enough to come along with soft tyres. Three, two, one, activate. So Paul Baxter gets us off and underway with full metal anorak and he's chosen the maze as opposed to the central ramp and the other avenue which takes on the house robots. Robots like Shunt and Sergeant Bash and Matilda. You just put a glimpse of her in the top of the picture. We'll see her again later on. Paul Baxter hopes he won't see too much of her. Looks like a stealth bomber with teeth. Taking on the landmines. Now they're not real landmines. Good burst of pace! Over the spikes and through! Good drive by Paul Baxter! Let's see. Why didn't you go that way? Uh, they look a bit dangerous. Would you run that way? <laughs> well, I don't know. What's it made out of? Uh, aluminium and mild steel. Well, it would have been all right. You're a wetty. You're a wetty. Officially a wetty, but well done. Yes. He says he wants to drive a Formula One car. He's driven into pole position with full metal anorak. Robot ears, stand by. Talk of the devil with Adam Pengilly and Lee Chenery. They want to go to America and compete in Robot Wars there. Three, two, one, activate. The turntable rotates and talk of the devil coming out backwards, reversing out to save precious seconds. And this is our robot, talk of the devil. On the front here, we've got a rotating cutting disc connected up to a starter motor. On the back, some rear defense. Hopefully cut something in there. Good weapons, but it looks like some rusty old pig out there. And immediately, Sergeant Bash, making it feel hot, hot, hot. Adam Pengilly is trying to control it away. There's no pace, no direction. Don't get on that grid. This is hot stuff. 
And he's on the grid. I don't think it's going to get out to Er is human. To Gurr is robot. She activates robot. I hope that thing's made out of asbestos. Good one, mate. Were you planning on going that way? Uh, no. <laughs> and what's it feel like going up against that thing, then? Uh, it's a wimp. It's a wimp. It's a wimp, but it took you out. But anyway, well done. You got, ooh, six or eight feet there. Talk of the devil, 4.92 meters, and I think that'll be beaten. Robot ears, stand by. Body hammer with driver Robin Herrick, Andrew Dayton Lovett and Steve Jones back in the pits, the cold fusion team. Three, two, one, activate. Now I think Robin Herrick and his team of nuclear engineers are going to be difficult to beat with body hammer. The conical shape will make it awkward to knock out. It's powered by four power tool motors. It's got a hardened outer shell. It's got that hammer, but it needs to get through the maze first. We're Team Cold Fusion, and this is our robot, Body Hammer. Can it get past the drills? He's been very, very careful with this. Nowhere near his top speed of nine miles an hour. Through the two grids. Up come the spikes. Avoiding them with a quick turn. Can he get off that grid? I don't think he's stuck. That's good driving, and Body Hammer through. I believe it. Neither can I. It's a bit of touch and go at the end there. Well, that was impressive. That was very, very impressive. Well done. Body Hammer completing the course in second place behind Full Metal Anorak. Robot ears, stand by. Team Warthog, made up by two brothers and a friend, the Brown Boys, and Tom Anthony back in the pits. Three, two, one. Activate. Oliver Brown driving, Nick Brown, his brother, looking on. They're slow to get out at the turntable. Oh, dear, oh, dear. And that's immediately stuck on that fence and dented. This is Warthog. It's a middleweight robot designed for speed and agility, and it uses its bodywork as its weaponry. But, Oliver, I don't think speed of Concord's going to help you here. Stop and deactivate robots. So how many months' work was that? I don't want to talk to you. I reckon about two months to go two yards. No comment. You don't look desperately happy. It's because I'm not. Right. <laughs> well, on that note, we'll get back to the game. And I was wrong. Talk of the devil's performance is good enough. Warthog are worrying. What's your policy going to be for this first round? Oh, to keep out of trouble. We're just defensive. There is no other robot like this one, is there? Good luck, guys. I wish you all the best. How can you be defensive with a giant Brussels sprout? Robot ears, stand by. The psycho sprout father and son team. Dad, Chris Marston, letting 16-year-old Toby drive. Three, two, one. Activate. Won't you roll away the stone? Here it comes. It's out. The sphere controlled by a team that calls itself the Boy Sprouts. Now, a rolling stone gathers no moss. A rolling sprout gathers a sergeant bash. Impaled, and I wonder how on earth it's going to get out of that. Meet Psycho Sprite. Inside Psycho Sprite is a proprietary chassis with some of the components upgraded. The idea is that as this runs inside the chassis, the truck actually climbs up the inside of the wall, and as the centre of gravity is far over to one side, the whole sprite actually rolls along. That's telling us, young Toby, one of his hobbies is to grow carnivorous plants. He's certainly going to have to eat up some ground here to get away from Sergeant Bash. And that's circular saw, and the flamethrower, and the spike. And I think Sergeant Bash is helping him along here, and I think he's helped him far enough! Stop and deactivate robots. Well now, Toby, that was, um... Basically, you tried to reinvent the wheel. Which I'm not so sure was such a bad idea in the first place. Uh, yes, well, won't be trying that design again anyway. <laughs> Thanks very much. Psycho Sprout in third place with nine meters. Warthog now very nervous. Toby, what happened? It works now. I know. It, just at the wrong moment, it starts to work again. 
I think there's probably a bit of interference by the TV cameras as well. That probably didn't help. But you can't blame <laughs> the t you cannot blame the telly for your lack of technology. Well, it's worth a try. <laughs> now you're all scientists, guys, but can science help you against the house robots? Most definitely, science and design will always overcome brute power and ignorance. So prove it. Which route are you going to take in the gauntlet? Well, actually, in the first round, I think we'll take the uh, middle route. We do. We want to be gentle on the house robots to start with. In fact, you're going to avoid them altogether. You are We're aware of the pendulum, though, aren't you? We are indeed aware of the pendulum, but that, again, will just bounce off us. OK. We'll off you go, then. Thank Good you. luck. Roboteers, stand by. Driver Richard Finch, Craig Williams and Tim Callady are all big sci-fi fans. Three, two, one. Activate. Reality looks like a UFO. Taking on the ramp as we first thought there's a little alien in that cockpit. Can you see it? This is our robot. It's called Reality. It stands for Reverse Engineered Alien Technology. There he is. E.T. E8. But they're through the ramp. Out comes the drill. Slow speed on Reality. Only nine miles an hour. Got a 25 degree maximum climb. Powered by those six... 90 watt motors. The smoke won't hurt it. It's whether or not it can get up and over this ramp. Already done enough to go through. And it beat the course. And that pendulum, they're aware of it. They've timed it and they are through. Guys, guys, guys. If I could deduct points for smugness, I would. <laughs> How did that feel? Fantastic. We were very worried and very concerned it was going to hold together, but uh, very relieved now. Yeah. Well, well done. An impressive demonstration. Seemed a little bit nervy there, but he is through. And Warthog go out at this stage. That's the end of the first event. Let's see how our teams are doing. This is reality looking very smug. Hardly any adjustments to make there because they did very well. Toby, are you doing all right? Keep almost ready for the next part, yes. Good. Keep up the good work. And uh, they're here. <laughs> Talk of the devil. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me, what are these dents? Still uh, feeling a bit warm as well after Sergeant Bash. It's still warm on top after the flamethrower, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Sergeant Bash got hold of us and then uh, went to town with us for toast now. So <laughs> we've got to try and get this patched up before we get some fiberglass in there before the next round. How are you feeling about the next round? Do you think you can do it? Lucky to be there, so we're going to give it our best shot in there. So. Good for you, good luck. Right. Toby, you want to be a botanist. Is this giant sprout your first step towards botany? I don't know about botany, but it's my first step towards genetic engineering, I reckon. <laughs> Well, good luck. They're calling for you in the arena, so are, are you ready to go? In this week's trial, our five surviving robots have to take on a steel maze called the Labyrinth. Now, there are lots of different routes through it, so only a complete idiot would ever end up going down a dead end. Um, what makes it particularly difficult is that all the time you're being attacked, not only by your fellow competitors, but by the superheated halitosis of Sergeant Bash. Quite. Then there's Shunt, who is a psychopath, and Matilda, who is always in a bad mood. But then wouldn't you be if you had a chainsaw sticking out of your bottom? As usual, the last one to reach the end zone, or the one that covers the least distance, will be killed and eaten. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one, activate. And immediately, the robot ears face a sort of chicane. Too many robots, not enough entrance gates to the maze. Reality to the left, they're doing well, and four metal anorak to the right. I just wonder about this outer shell of reality. It looks to me as if it's made out of cold spaghetti. And Body Hammer is in there as well, doing its little bit. Has to avoid those deadly spikes. And has a clear run through the middle there, Body Hammer. I think this one could go all the way. Mind you, Shunt is waiting. And here's Sergeant Bash to take on Talk of the Devil. Full Metal Anorak getting in underneath Sergeant Bash. Is that wise? Is it really wise? But he's shot past him now. And that's good manoeuvring. Body hammers in the way. Oh, look at that. Psycho Sprouts back in the starting grid. Strange tactics indeed. Talk of the devil. Talk of full metal anorak. Around the edge. He's only got one more. A little bit of maze to do. And full metal anorak is at the end of the maze and through. 
No wonder Paul Baxter is delighted. And look at this, he's fed up with waiting. I think he's trying to help out the others, I'm not too sure. Yes, he is! He's giving Matilda a shunt up the backside. Remember what's in that backside, Paul Metalanarak? A vicious saw. And you don't want to get yourself hurt, not at this stage, with time ticking down on the rest. Cease. But it doesn't matter that it's all over, because Psycho Sprout has gone backwards. Now then, that was a fine performance. Any problems? Um, bit, of, bit of wheel spin uh, and boredom. I went and did a bit of damage with Matilda in the end. <laughs> boredom? Well, that's one way of looking at it. I can't really finish this without having a word with you. Six feet forwards and then seven feet back. Yeah, well, I got into that corner and once the Sprite had decided it wasn't going to let me... You coughed it, it up. So, uh, yeah, actually. So there we are. Well done, everybody. Except, uh, except you. Commiserations to the Psycho Sprout team, their robot vegetating on the starting line and rolling out of the competition. Now, Paul... You actually said in there to Jeremy that you'd got a bit bored at times. I was amazed how quick I got through to the finish and I looked back and noticed some of the guys in trouble so I went back and had a second go. <laughs> <laughs> it was stupid, might be the word. I think I've blown the motor but we'll see, we'll repair it and go again. Do you really think you've blown the motor? Well, I saw smoke pouring out of the uh, wheel guards so there's something, uh, something blown in there. It'll go again. Okay, well we'll catch up with you and find oh, out. Thanks. See you later. <laughs> everything just went against us. There just wasn't enough leeway, it didn't have a hope. That's it then? Yes, for this year. We'll be back next year. Got a bit of a major problem here. What's your major problem? The, you did very well, didn't The you? wheel has uh, snapped off and we've got to look at the gearbox and we might have to send for a replacement shaft from the makers of the motor. They overheard us saying we were going to go for Matilda and that's what we did. Uh, but unfortunately they got there first. <laughs> I keep advising people not to combat directly with our house robots. We've got to Does give anyone it a go. ever listen to me? No, nope. no one ever listens to a thing I say. Okay, so we move on now to the semi finals, which will be presided over by the usual panel of judges. Now they're going to be looking for damage, control, style, and aggression, but we hope they won't be needed. We hope that the Roboteers will get out there and smash their opponents into pieces so small that they'll actually be classified as dust. I have some important news for you. I want to tell you who you're up against. Go on. Who have we got? Who would you hate? Um, anybody as big as we are. Who would you like? Uh, anybody very small with no armour. Okay, you got talk of the devil. Um, that would do. Have you seen this here? Put the plaster on there, so. <laughs> but, uh, we've, we've patched him up there, so I mean... How do you feel about Body Hammer? Well, I, uh, I'd rather one of the other smaller ones, right? But, uh, they're all as good as each other, and uh, if we're going to go out, we'd rather go up to one of the better ones. Good luck! Don't dismantle it again. Oh. Body hammer! Where's your hammer? Well, we had a small problem. Yeah. What did you change it for, then? The weapons pod is an hour disruptor instead. Okay. I hope it works. Well, they've been my tips throughout, but I wonder if that'll make a difference for this semi-final. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one, activate. Well, even though it lacks weaponry, Body Hammer will still be the quicker. Talk of the Devil, driven by Adam Pengilly, slow off the mark and difficult to manoeuvre. And if there is no damage done, the judges will look for control and style. For that, of course, damage and aggression, very, very valuable. And the plaster protection already punctured. And there's the power of those four motors within that copper-coloured body hammer coating. And Talk of the Devil is now open to the mercy or the devilry of dead metal. With those awful pincers. And I think they realise they're in major trouble. Body hammer seems to be doing a victory jig. Look at that, they pulled it out of trouble and put it back in the arena. You're not supposed to do that, house robots. Talk of the devil. One last stab at it. In goes body hammer again. Crushing blow. Talk of the devil looks like a pig. Now a stuck pig. Immobile and body hammer doing the damage and closing in for the kill. 
seats. Well, now we must have a chat about that. First of all, congratulations. Second, you were aiming for its back where its cutting blade was. I was aiming for the side. I need a bit more practice. You do not need more practice. That was a masterful display. And then I love taking on dead metal there. That was brave call. We've got to try out our capabilities, see what we can do. I think it was brilliant because I love the speed, I love the maneuverability, and I love your aggression. You're through. Thanks very much. Yes, indeed. Let's take one final look at Body Hammer, giving Talk of the Devil a very heavy body blow. Guys, you've barely sustained a scratch on your beautiful finish. Mm, little bit here of a bend. Here and there. Made it safe, made it cool. Well done. Ah. It's a stunning fight. Are you going to put the hammer back in for the final? Oh, we haven't made our mind up yet. Probably. We better hurry up. <laughs> haven't got long. You sustained some damage. Still in one piece, as you say. A testament to the. Look at the side of this. That was dead metal. Nearly, yeah. That did that. Was it a bit of duff engineering? No. No. Never. No. I don't do duff engineering. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one, activate. Now, right at the start of the program, Paul Baxter, driver of Full Metal Anorak there at the top of your picture, said watch out for his blade at the front of his stealth bomber. Reality team, concentrated, wonder how long that UFO framework will hold out, though. Just checking each other out at the moment, and in comes the sergeant! And that bodywork did resist the circular saw. Looks okay to me. And then, there are the spikes. So at this moment in time, reality just pleasing the judges more than Full Metal Anorak. Their decision is final, not mine. If it goes the distance, Certainly that blade, not operational at the moment for Paul Baxter with Paul Matalanarak. He can't manoeuvre himself into position to have a go at reality. He would be on top for me because of their control, style and aggression. No real damage caused. Oh, just missed out on the grid there. Now, is Paul Baxter using excessive evasion, trying to dodge reality, coming in with the spikes? Is he running away too much? In other words, because the judges don't like it. Is he a little yellow belly full metal anorak? In he goes, though. Oh, but he's gone the wrong way. He's on the grid. And that'll be it. Reality will be through because he won't get off there. Cease. It's victory for Richard Finch, Craig Williams, and Tim Calladine. And Paul Baxter is out, and he knows it. For a very long time there, I thought it was going to be stalemate. It was. Uh, he was running away quite rapidly, but we managed to skewer him a few times and just wear him down. It was uh, fantastic. Well, congratulations. You're through to the next round with the noisiest machine of the lot. Well, that sounds almost like a demented, mechanised cricket to me. Hey. Hey. They had a superior design, I'm afraid. And just wore me down. That's the way life is. It was close, though. Um... It was closer than I thought it would be. I thought they'd trounce me straight away. But we uh, got a couple of minutes out of it, which is good. Good fun, good laugh. What damage? Just a bit of body work. Nothing a, a big hammer won't put right. It was a close run thing, that, wasn't it? It was. We were worried at one time when we went, we went up and then this, the spikes came up from underneath. We thought we were going to be really damaged like that, but it looks like we've come out pretty unscathed. A toasted flag. A toasted flag. <laughs> is that Sergeant Bash's fault? <laughs> it's a great show, thank you. Okay. It's almost unbelievable, but tonight's final is between the chirping monkey's breakfast from Gloucester. Worcester. Worcester, you're from Gloucester, aren't you? With the coal scuttle. Are you ready? Yep, that's right. You ready? We're ready. Go on then, get in your booths and let's have some fighting. Robot ears, stand by. Three, two, one, activate. So, which will become our fifth robot through to the grand final by winning here now? 
Matilda in on Body Hammer. Body Hammer spinning away from Matilda, who looks even more ugly tonight. And thrusting reality against that spike. Turning nimbly away from Matilda, who does have reality. She looks grumpy. I think, I think she's suffering from PMT. Pre-mechanical tension, of course. Tries to get back off the Body Hammer. And Body Hammer's on the grill. Come on, the reality boys. Get in there, get in there. That's what they're saying. Matilda's already there. Body Hammer on the grill. Pull the torch, though, for the reality team. In it comes with the prongs. No, you don't take on shunt. You take on Body Hammer. Body Hammer's off that grill. Give it a little bit of a shunt of assistance. In a bit of a tears. Get away from the spikes. Now turning again. Where's reality? Too dangerously near the side ropes. If it goes over those ropes, it'll be out. Body Hammer will have won it, so get out of there, boys. Body Hammer turns away, then, from the sergeant in the background. Shunt there on the grill is immobilized itself. Up on the side, it's all over for the reality, boys! And Body Hammer will be the winners! Tonight's winner is Body Hammer! Huge congratulations, well done. You look like you weren't expecting that. Uh, we weren't sure. Because I think the problem was their wheel came off. I mean, that's it, they did sustain damage, and yours is still fine, yeah? It's still driving. You're happy? Yeah, I'm happy. That's what I like to hear, because you're through to the grand final. We're back next week. See you then. More robot wars are waged in just a second. It's a bit dodgy at one it? point. It's close, isn't it? Very close. Bad driving. <laughs> we were still moving, look. We should have won that. They were twice our way. We'll be back. Last week, Body Hammer fought his way into our grand final to face previous victors. Roadblock from show one. Three Cyclops from show two. Robot the Bruce from show three, and Cunning Plan, who joined them in the race to become the first British Robot Wars champion. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the warmonger of Robot Wars, Jeremy Clarkson. Throughout history, warmongers have promised that their conflict would be the mother of all battles. But tonight, we're going to show them how a proper war should be fought. The whole series has been leading up to tonight's final showdown. And from throughout the land, we're getting reports of a nation on tenterhooks. Men attending their allotments. Women are cooking supper. Children are tucked up in bed dreaming of the day when they can have a pony. But here in the east end of London, we have six more robots revved up and ready to fight it out for that last place in the final showdown. A battle that will be held at the end of tonight's programme. Before we fire up the flamethrowers and charge up the chainsaws in this half-hour homage to Greenpeace, let's meet them. First, from Oxford, Scarab. A durable-looking robot weighing in at 86.3 kilograms, Scarab utilizes two suspension springs salvaged from a 1923 vintage car. From Mitchum, the Blob. Covered in graffiti, but determined to make a clean name for itself and a clear run at speeds of up to 15 miles an hour. But in practice, it's been a lot slower and more ponderous than that. From King Edward VI Grammar School, Tracy. Ah, might have a girl's name, but nothing ladylike about our Tracy, made of welded steel with deadly spikes and a very low center of gravity, only 20 centimeters high. From Enfield, Elvis. Yes, the king is alive and protected by a pneumatic expanding rivet ram at the front and a body shell which gyrates just like Elvis the pelvis. From Sutton, Prince of Darkness. This homemade robot weighs in at 27.2 kilograms and runs off two 14.4 volt drill motors. Not the most aesthetically pleasing robot, but certainly powerful. 
From Maidenhead, Eubank the Mouse. Driven by two 12 volt wheelchair motors, this nippy rodent travels at 15 miles an hour and threatens all opponents with a mean right hook left cross combination. Those are the final six contenders to show their metal in Robot Wars. Back to you, Jeremy. Right. Now you've met the metal. It's time to test the testosterone with our first event. Please welcome defending the gauntlet tonight, our house robots, the matriarch, Matilda. There's dead metal with those rather painful pincers at the front. And Sergeant Bash, as ever, our robots have to avoid these and the traps and obstacles that are set in their way to astonish, flummox, and downright incapacitate them. You know, in the olden days, a gauntlet was a type of glove. Right, Roboteers, I challenge you, be more interesting than that. Roboteers, stand by. Ooh, driver Phil Patching with the blob looks nervous. His engineers Gareth Monday and Simon Carroll. Three, two, one, activate. Driven by that 12-volt electric battery. Can be run at 24 volts. It'll lead to overheating, though. And certainly the sergeant can with his flamethrower. And dead metal closes, and here comes Matilda around the back to join him in the fun. Driving Blob again towards the ramp this time. Matilda's tusks are grisly. In goes dead metal. The Blob, it's built for the heavyweight division, it's a heavy robot, and it's going to crash and bash, and we're going to crash and bash with this. Are you sure? A lot of crashing, uh, a lot of bashing, and uh, the Blob isn't doing any of it. Matilda certainly is. Driver Phil told us one of the things we have to look out for here was grotesque ugliness. Uh, on the robot, that is. He activates robots. So, um, using the power of hindsight, what changes would you have made to strategy there? Uh, choose another driver, really. <laughs> and then the machine broke down as well? Uh, I think, yeah, probably cook the electrics or something like that. I think, you know, with bigger motors, a bit more ramming power, take them out, burn them up. Mm, but you didn't do any of that. Still, well done, you got, oh, I don't know, a few feet. Oh, popular team, though, I hope they're back for later on. First to go, of course, they're top of the leaderboard with seven metres. Roboteers, stand by. Driver Neil Lambeth is 23. He's a special effects artist and wants to work on feature films. Three, two, one, activate. Elvis is obviously still with us in that sort of sparkly light shade thing. Already stuck though, only a tiny ground clearance. Hi, I'm Neil from Team Orangeville. It's my heavyweight robot where Elvis lives. You can have one of these though. I'm not too sure whether Elvis would have wanted one. Ah, but the light shade moves. In comes the sergeant with the saw and already made in dents. And the pretty paintwork is wrecked totally. And could be burnt off with a flamethrower. And Elvis is going nowhere at the moment. He needs some blue suede shoes to get out of there. Oh, you hound dog, Sergeant. Leave him alone. And deactivates robots. Good heavens, it's Jacques Villeneuve, except he's world champion and you're not. What on earth went wrong there? Obviously, uh, not, not quite my sport. Need to practice your driving skills there a bit. Still, thanks very much for coming, and now, um, go home. <laughs> and I think they will be with 2.75 metres. That isn't very far, boys. Robot ears, stand by. The Tracy team from King Edward VI Grammar School in Chelmsford. The driver is Andrew Rockcliffe, head of electronics. Three, two, one. Tracy stands for Terrestrial Robotic Artificial oh, Computerized oh. Intelligent Engine. Now you know. Away from Bash, slowly, very slowly. In comes the flamethrower, too high though. This is our robot, Tracy. She's in the heavyweight category, and as you can see, she's quite sturdily built. It's got a unique facility that can turn upside down and still continue going. That's why I have the casters on both top and bottom. It's got the spikes as the weapon too. Ew, there's the sergeant's saw and flamethrower. You can flip it over. It'll move on both sides, but not very far. Stop and deactivate robots. So, did you imagine it was going to be like that then? 
No. <laughs> and what was different about it? It was hard. It was very difficult. Oh, dear. Should have called it Sharon. Would have been better. Right, well, there we are. Well done anyway. You got about halfway. Just over, in fact. And that pleases the supporters of the Tracy team because they're top of the leaderboard with 8.7 metres. Robot ears, stand by. Steve Dove, a 40-year-old manufacturing supervisor, is the driver of the maps. Three, two, one, activate. And out of the mouse hole he comes past our own kitty cats. There's the sergeant and dead metal. And up against their power, two boxing gloves and a deadly right hook and left cross, says Steve. Very nippy, though. A zero turning circle. Low ground clearance, nothing's going to get underneath that. Away from the spikes, away from dead metal, top of your picture, and Matilda. Oh, tremendous stuff, and it's through! I've got to say, ordinarily, I don't like to see my pets being beaten, but that was great. Yeah, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Did you really expect to be able to beat them? No, I was hoping to get about halfway, and then think, I thought they'd just get me. That was just great, marvellous mouse, well done. Terrific robot, great entertainment, and the mouse top of the leaderboard. The only one through to complete. Robot ears, stand by. The ISIS team members in your picture there, Jonathan Attias and Chris Crosskey. Three, two, one, activate. Scarab named after an ancient Egyptian beetle. Looks more like a birthday cake on wheels. But beyond Sergeant Bash's flamethrower, very slowly, very securely, very powerful actually, with the two wheelchair motors. And that big weapon on top, a steel bar. As Dead Metal goes to close. Chris Crosskey looks more like Chris Crosspatch there. We're Team Isis from Oxford. Uh, this is our robot Scarab. It's driven by two wheelchair motors, and the main feature of it is this hammer, which is sprung loaded and uh, we rewind it using a car starter motor. Well, they may well be slow, but they've already beaten the 2.75 metres. They've done enough to qualify, and I think they've gone all the way! They have! You made it! That's a very plodding robot you've got there. It's got a bit of power in it, but... Mm, a bit of power, but not much speed. That's as we can get it to go, I'm afraid. What's it like when you're being attacked by those things? Um, I wasn't really paying much attention to them, actually. Just uh, trying to force my way through. Right, deduct points for smugness. <laughs> well done, though. That was a good, steady performance. Jonathan and Chris have done enough with the Scarab team in second place, and they're safely through. Robot ears, stand by. Prince of Darkness, driven by 16-year-old John Scott, the team all teenagers at the Green Shore School in Sutton. This is the Prince of Darkness. We built this in under five hours. It's powered by two powerful motors who will actually pull the motor car. Three, two, one, activate. Those two motors come from domestic power tools. It looks like one of those old sort of go-karts you made, though, when you're about seven. Two boxes and two old rubber wheels at the back. The flame torch will destroy them, or the steam jet. No! The Prince of Darkness is going all the way! Look at that! Oh, until Matilda came across, but did it cross the line first? They think so, but the judges say no! They've got to do it all again! It wasn't all the way over the line, and Matilda trades it against the spikes! Now! Matilda! Can't manoeuvre! They can get away this time! Can they cross the line once and for all? Yes, they can! That is the worst robot I've ever seen in my life, and it crossed the line twice. That thing can pull a car. And what would have happened if Sergeant Bash had attacked it with his flamethrower? It probably would have been a bit alike, but it would have been more spectacular for the audience. Well, that's very, very thoughtful of you to bring such a miserable little robot along. And amazingly, that's made it. The prince is through, the king has gone. Heartbreak Hotel for Elvis, out. The king is dead. Obviously, you have uh, damaged me paintwork there. This, <laughs> it was so beautiful as well, wasn't it? Best part of it, though, wasn't it? Spent hours doing that. Look at those blackened by the house robots. You can't afford to be arrogant with them, you no, see. They're gonna die. They're gonna die. They're going down. A bigger spike and more power. Snooker. 
Let's be honest, not the most exciting sport ever to grace our television screens. Robot snooker, on the other hand, is right up there with nude powerboat racing. Here's how it works. Basically, each of our five remaining robots has been allocated a pocket. Now, when the action begins, they're going to leap out and spend the duration of the game trying to fill it up again with as many of these balls as they possibly can. Now, obviously, it's going to be mayhem out here. There'll be balls going everywhere. It'll be own goal city. But we're not bothered because when time's up, the roboteer with the least amount of balls in their pocket will be taken outside, tied to a post, and just left there, really. Roboteers, stand by. Three, two, one. Activate. Well, the blob is very quickly out and breaks and is aggressive. And let me point out straight from the start, if more than one robot fails to score, then the least active of those robots will go out. You've got to be active, you've got to be aggressive. And I wonder what's happened to Tracy, impaired on that side fence, it would seem. There's a long pot attempted by the Prince of Darkness, who very interestingly has that bucket on the front now to help it with a short little pot in there. That's the first ball potted home and slotted home and the scarab equalises. Now they told me they're going to sit on their pocket and protect it tactically. Tracy's still stuck on the fence there to the left-hand side. And look at the Prince of Darkness, another long pot attempted there. Comes home just to edge it in. That's three balls. The Blob tries to get one back. Go on. Go on. Oh, so close. The Blob's still working hard. You see, Tracy can't impair there. And I think that the mouse seems to have broken down. The Prince of Darkness, though, ready to rack and stack them in. In goes the fourth ball off the bottom of your picture there. A fifth one goes in. The Prince of Darkness is romping it. And there's a sixth for the Prince of Darkness. Cease. He's through, so too the Scarab. Now, who was the least active of the rest with no balls? Oh, no, I'm being told that the mouse has irreparably broken down and he's out. The mouse has gone. Shoot up by the kitty cats. Right, that's an impressive score. Mind you, you, you weren't really up against much, were you? No, I was quite glad, actually, the competition broke down because I thought it was going to be quite badly beaten up. Yeah, wh what happened to yours, then? She's just a bitch, <laughs> to be quite honest. <laughs> Same call, it's Sharon. I want to see a respray for the next round. Sharon, right? And you're out. I'm out. Best looking one here. Well, some say. So on that, we'll uh, move on to the next round, I guess. <laughs> oh, hard cheese. It was a bit of a tight squeak, but I'm afraid the mouse has gone out. Yeah. <laughs> It's time for the semi-finals, where the real fighting begins. Now, in case our roboteers don't get stuck in properly, the four house robots are on hand to garnish proceedings with a little chilli sauce. And if, at the end of the bout, the two robots are still running, we shall turn to our panel of adjudicators for a decision. Now, they're going to be marking you, roboteers, for style, control, violence and aggression. I, on the other hand, am only interested in violence. So get out there and do some. Roboteers, stand by. Phil Patching and the heavyweight blob team. That weighs 68 kilograms. Three. Oh, and there, Peter Kyber, the engineer, joining the Scarab one. team in the driver's box for the first time. Head to head, heavy metal. Heavy metal thunder. Like dodging cars out there. And here comes the torch. What on earth is Sergeant Bass doing so far out of his control area? Oh, look at that hammer blow. Missed. Thank goodness for the blob team, but the scarab team in there looked determined. And this time, it's oh no, whoa, the big heave ho! Out onto those side bars. So difficult to escape from, especially with the sergeant coming in. Oh, you could be right. You could be stone dead. Oh, rust. In peace, the blob! Your robot, right, is the slowest here. Probably, yeah. It is also the least powerful. Well, I don't know about that. Mm, it looks like cheese on toast and its hammer doesn't work and you still got through. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> amazing is one way of looking at it. Still, we'll see you in the next round.
you call this? Prince of Darkness. You said it was an amateur job, so now we made it professional. It's a bit tacky still. It looks fantastic. Well done, Guy. Thanks very much. I'm a bit disappointed, though, because we quite like that amateurish go-kart you made yourself <laughs> in the garage feel to it, but that's how we'll always think of it. Roboteers, stand by. So it's a seven-year-old go-kart with wet paint. Three, two, one, activate. But it is the crowd favourite. It's uh, David against uh, heavyweight Goliath in the shape of Tracy. With those sharp prongs that could maim and damage and destroy. And don't forget, Tracy could be flipped up and over and can still survive. I'm not too sure whether the Team Scimitar Prince of Darkness boys can do just that. Oh, look at that! Already a puncture! In comes the spike, like a dagger to the heart of the Prince of Darkness boys. Prince of Darkness and Tracy dancing together. Sounds like some awful disco scene. In comes another dagger, another puncture. And surely that will immobilize Prince of Darkness. It's held now, pinned in by those sharp bronze. There's the punctured tire. Very, very close towards the grid at the top of your picture. They wouldn't get out from there. I don't think they're going to escape anyway. Almost up and almost over. The Tracy boys pinning back the Prince of Darkness team. In comes the Sergeant and Dead Metal and Matilda. They sense the kill. It's almost all over in like vultures. Oh, dear, unfair play, surely. Three wheels on my wagon. And I've got nowhere to Cease. go. Tracy, well done, come on. Thank you, thank you, thank you for removing the most miserable robot from the equation. We did it for you. Now look, you um, were very rude about that earlier. Called it rude names. What do you think now? She's gorgeous. She is gorgeous. See you in the next round. Slow moving cheese on toast. Is that reference to a comment that Jeremy made? Yes, it is. We think it's desperately unfair. It looks more like a coffee cake. <laughs> I don't care what it looks like. How's it going to perform? We think we've got the hammer working at last. Fingers crossed. And uh, Killatron, in order to help us uh, uphold the honour of the hammer box, because we're the last one left, uh, has lent us their mace because uh, it will give us the reach to get into the centre of Tracy's electronics. You've had an awful lot of problems with Tracy all the way through. How is it looking now? Uh, well, we're feeling confident. We've got it, everything sorted out, so we're looking for a good bout. OK. Good luck. Ooh, it's all tension up here. They're fighting it out for the last place in the grand finale. You nervous? A little, yeah. You? Yeah, very nervous. Very nervous, that's very honest. Good man, we'll get down in your booths. Let's find out who it's going to be. <laughs> Robot ears, stand by. There's the mace led by Killatron, an earlier competitor Three, in Robot Wars. Two, one, activate. And the two heavyweights come together. Oh, and there are those dangerous prongs immediately coming into play from Tracy. We've seen what damage they can cause. And puncturing the side of Scarab. In come the house robots. Matilda bottom of your picture. Dead metal to the right hand side. And I wonder what damage that's caused. The puncturing. Oh, of Scarab. I'll tell you what, he's ripped the flesh off Scarab. Has Tracy you can see it trailing off one of the deadly prongs. And up against it, that mace is like a little school ground conquer against a juggernaut. In comes Tracy once again, spinning, turning, good driving. Oh, is it out of control there again? Surely not mental enough to take on the sergeant. I don't know, though. Look at the damage caused. And certainly, Shunt seems to think twice before coming in. But Matilda takes on the scarab with that sword to tail. And off comes the radio control mast. And that could leave it immobile. I think the mace is out. And meanwhile, Tracy isn't out of control. It's mad enough or vicious enough to take on Matilda's tusks. And that'll be earning points. The judge is deciding on damage, aggression, control and style. And surely it'll go to points now. Surely it'll go to the judges. And Tracy now attacks the sergeant. Well, he's got that some front. It's got to be a judge's decision. I mean, you see the action in there. Well, Tracy certainly was more aggressive and caused more damage right from the start. 
That's where the body shell of Scarab was pierced. Scarab tries to spin and knock it away, and that's what thrust Tracy into the patrol area, and then more damage caused it went on the attack. Damage caused to Scarab by Matilda. Tracy taking on Matilda. Oh, forward of Scarab. He knows he's already beaten Scarab, the Tracy driver. Now, what shall I do? I'll take on the toughest of the lot, the sergeant. Well, thanks for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to say we now have got a result, unanimous, judged as usual on damage, aggression, style, and control. And the winner... Tracy! <laughs> you really have got a fan club here, haven't you? Huge congratulations. Was it fun? It was awesome. That bit where you got stuck, you must have thought it was all over. I did, but one of the house robots helped us out, so that was great. They're nice guys. I've been saying all along, they're nice guys. And I love your sportsmanship. When the uh, cheese on toast was being attacked, you were helping it out. No, we just had to have a go at those house robots. Deeply satisfying. Well, you've done it. You are through. You've earned yourself a place in the grand final. You better go get yourselves ready. Well done. Now, this is it. This is what the whole series has been leading up to. An orgy, a six-way orgy of death and destruction. And into the final from Heat 1, Roadblock diverting all opponents to take the glory road. From Heat 2, Recyclops with the extending tongue licking all opponents. From Heat 3, the brute force of Robot the Bruce. And our featherweight pretender cunning plan speeding to victory in Heat 4. Next, the copper-coloured coal scuttle working out the maze in Heat 5. And they're all joined by tonight's winner, the not-so-ladylike Tracy. Six of them are going into the arena now for the very last time, and the excitement here in the pits is intense. We cannot wait to watch it. There'll be crowds around the monitor. We're going to enjoy this just as much as you are. And here we are, Philippa, the final of Robot Wars. Here's Stand By. There they are, the drivers of Roadblock with its scooped front and Body Hammer, the Cold Fusion team, and Rex Garrod on the right, driver of Recyclops with the extending ton. There's Cunning Plan from the University of Reading. Three, two, and Robot the Bruce and one. Tracy from tonight. Activate. And this for the title, the first ever UK Robot Wars champion. Aggressive style already, especially from Tracy spiking Recyclops. And that allows Roadblock to come in underneath. There's the extended tongue. But Recyclops can't flip Tracy over at this moment in time. Tracy comes back. There's Body Hammer in the spotlight briefly. And running away, cunning plan. Needs to get back into the action and be aggressive. And it is there because the judges will mark for aggression. And Tracy's up on... Cunning plan, and both of them are out, immobilised. Four left, Body Hammer, and Recyclops, and Robert the Bruce there to the left-hand side, and the dangerous Roadblock, who's persisting in this attack on Recyclops, the most dangerous attacking robot otherwise in the field. But up on its side, Recyclops. Down it comes, the tongue takes a fearful bashing. Roadblock still pressurising, and Body Hammer thrusts into Robot the Bruce, Recyclops on its side. Not yet down, Robot the Bruce trying to get involved. Rex Garrard needs to get his tongue back in, in every sense of the word. Recyclops, top of your picture. There's the chain off Recyclops! And that attacking by Roadblock has paid off. Recyclops is out, and down to three, Body Hammer. Roadblock behind it, and there's Robot the Bruce up on his side, and goes as well, and that leaves two. The Roadblock team of students from Bodmin against the team of nuclear engineers and Body Hammer. Here's Roadblock closing in on the far more experienced engineering team, getting in underneath. It's over. It goes to the judges. And the arena on its feet, a standing ovation. Well, I think that calls for a judge's decision. And while we await it, let's have a look at some of the action from that battle royal. These, the six, bidding to become the champions of the first series of Robot Wars. Recyclops. Attacked by Roadblock. Roadblock in the thick of things again as Tracy takes out Cunning Plan and goes out herself. Roadblock then attacking Recyclops and Robot the Bruce. Just about anyone had a go at Recyclops. Especially Roadblock. And Recyclops, the chain came off in the end. Leaving three. And Roadblock putting out Robot the Bruce after a suicidal charge. And my money's on Roadblock, but let's see what the judges have to say. All right, quieten down, everybody. Quieten down. We have a decision. 
a unanimous one from the judges that the winner, the British Robot Wars Champion Series 1, is Roadblock! You did it, guys! You did it! There it is, the trophy. And a very, very well earned one, if I may be so bold. What was that like? Best time of my life. Absolutely loved it. It really was. Absolutely breathtaking. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being absolutely magnificent winners, champions, and thank you, everyone at home, for watching. Good night. Our tremendous staff. Well done. 17-year-old Tender Blewett and Chris Kinsey and their teacher down at Bobby Community College, Peter Kinsey, and their A-level project triumphing over the nuclear engineers of Body Hammer. Champions of the first series of Robot Wars UK, Roadblock, there are champs, but others are also recognised. The best engineered robot, Mortis from Cambridge University. The Sportsmanship Award goes to the boys from Dublin and Nemesis, they won a lot of friends. The best design award, the futuristic Blunderbird won. And the most original entry, the tasty-looking Psycho Sprout.